So this is the broadcast tool here, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see in all its glory. You can see the notation. You can also see the engine evaluation next to each move and also how long they spend. What I like is you can make your own moves on the board. You can check the alternatives to what the players did. And even for the moves you make, you get the computer evaluation here. Fantastic. I think you get it quicker and better as a premium member, such as yours truly. What I also like, there is a chat function. You can exchange things yeah. with people from all over the world. If you want to see something else, let's say you're watching a tournament and you want to see all the games at once, no problem displaying. I have no idea how many games there are, like 128 games at the same time. You can do even more. This is a team competition. You click on multi-board. That's beautiful. You can see all the eight games going on at once. You can see the games and standings, which I... What we got? I'll click around. Games and standings, here. Yeah. Analysis, if we click on that tab, that's Let's a nice click tab. on it. You can see there's a great little graphical illustration. The red line is zero, that is the absolute even mark. And if the white bars are go up, the further up they go, the bigger the advantage. And the black bars show a black advantage. Then there is a database, and here we get the alternatives. And we, if we click on a move in the database, bam. It gets played on the board. Fantastic. And then the PGN can even be downloaded. I like that feature. Yeah. Whatever tournament or game you're following, you click it and you open it in the program of your choice. Yeah, and one of the great things I like to see as well is when we get a video from the playing hall. I like to see them in their seats, nervous. You feel the tension, you feel like you're there, don't you? Chess is really becoming a spectator's internet sport. Great that we can see that. I also love to see um, the fact that we can get in some of our friends to join us during the broadcast. And it's all interactive, that's what we love. And a lot of overview functions there. A lot of great functions there, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you take advantage of all of them. Let's get back to the, uh, to the commentary. Keep tweeting us, Keep hashtag C24Live. We love to hear from you. Ask us anything about mainly about Lawrence Tra life, but if you have other questions, they're also welcome. Also, send us anything you like about Jan. F <laughs> hashtag C24 Live. Absolutely. Uh Chess is simple. You just make the right moves. And the move, there. and the move, the move Wesley made, I would not have guessed in blunder. a years. What? Blunder of the century. I'm really what? blunder. G8, can we now take on C8 with yeah, the exactly. added exactly. effect? This, this is like, what? The, the, what? This is the position we were discussing, but like, 100 times, 100 times. This is Rezinovich, no? He just, I think, correctly identified at, at what in chess he is better than Karekin. And he is saying, I'm going to be doing that with either color, I don't care. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm not just going to give you a safe game where you have all your, your plastic goals.
Honestly, I, 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 I struggle to remember some, something like this happening before. Anyway, we're being yeah. joined by, by the world champion. What happened in that last game? Was we're just struggling to explain what happened. You, you just repeated moves. I don't know. I, I guess he just figured there are two more matches, and uh, he'll try to win those. But this, I feel like, is 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 showing more talent than the position requires. <laughs> Which I think is always something you you don't really encourage. Everybody, welcome to day number three of the Lindoras Abbey Rapid Challenge quarterfinals, where today Ding Liren and Levon Aronian are in must win situations should they lose their mini matches against Yu Yang Yi and Hikaru Nakamura, respectively. They are out of the tournament, and Hikaru, with a win, would move on to the semifinals, potentially against Magnus Carlsen. The same, of course, goes for Yu Yang Yi, who would face the winner of Dubov versus Kayakin. And some would argue that few wins against Ding Liren. Dubov is up against Kayakin in that match. There is a path to go very far for Yu Yang Yi in this tournament. The same, of course, goes for Daniel Dubov. What I'm trying to say is they are not in the Magnus Hikaru bracket for now. I am excited about the matches because I thought that Ding Liren might potentially be the second biggest favorite next to Magnus in this whole event. But if he does not win today, he is out. And here to help us digest all of it will be Peter Leko a little bit later. And right here, right now, Tanya Sachdev. Tanya, how are you today? How are things? What's happening? Everything's really good, Jan. Hi, everybody. Uh, good to be back on the show. Um, I really like your intro, the, the passion and the beast mode on. I think it's a great prelude to what to the kind of chess we have coming on today. Uh, as you mentioned, Jan, must win situations for Ding and for Lev. I think the most, um, the most, you know, as commentators, we're supposed to be unbiased, right? We're not supposed to have uh, favorites. Uh, Speak for but, yourself. Go Anish. <laughs> ah, he's not in the tournament. But, but that said, I think what we saw in the first day of the mini matches for this, this bracket of quarterfinalists, um, in their first mini match, Hikaru against Lev, just a quick recap, I mean, to get, our, to get everybody up to date. That match was so intense, just full of ups and downs, and Levon really seemed like he had it. And then Hikaru coming back with that fantastic win in the final rapid game and going on to win in the Armageddon definitely left the Lev fans heartbroken because it seemed so close for him. Uh, on the other one as well, with Dingler and Yu Yangi, we were treated to an absolutely intensely crazy Armageddon. Dingler in. Uh, destroying Yu Yang in that Armageddon throughout with the black pieces, just totally in control, was flagged and went down in that mini match. So, like I was saying, um, we're supposed to not be biased, but I think both matches felt like a bit of a heartbreak, uh, a little, a little unfair to the ones who lost. But of course, fair play to everybody, and I am really excited because I think today. Seeing the kind of the, the matchups that we have and seeing the quality of, of play that we had in, in their rapid first mini match, it's going to be absolutely insane, Jan. Uh, talking about yesterday's quarterfinals, I think that was a very different vibe, a very different tone from what we saw in Hikaru's and Hikaru Lev and Yu Yangi Dingler in quarterfinal. I think yesterday was honestly just in both games, it felt like 
both matches, it just felt like a one-man show. Magnus just crushed Wesley, so uh, Daniel Dubov also crushed to Sergei Karyakin, scoring three big wins. And it's ironic because if you remember in the qualifying, in the round-robin stage of this tournament, where the top 12, where the best 12 players, some of the, at least most of the best players in the world were here, uh, eight made it to the quarterfinals. And as we can see, these were the standings. And funny enough, Magnus Carlsen and Daniel Dubov had a little bit of a struggle to get in. Magnus, after a fantastic day one, struggled in day two, day three. But the world champion got back to his winning ways. And when it mattered the most in that last round against Alireza, made it to the quarterfinals. But yesterday against Wesley, just completely destroyed him. It was... Uh, it was a bit of a no-show for Wesley. Daniel Dubov, on the other hand, Jan, really also, who would have thought he would even make it to the quarters? He had such an up-and-down event in the round robin, barely made it to the quarterfinals, and then yesterday just crashed through Sergei Karyakin's solid play. And for me, I think Peter's insight during yesterday's commentary, I think Peter really hit the nail on the spot when he said that in Daniel uh, Daniel's game, in his mini-match, he basically recognized which part of the game he's stronger in or feels more comfortable playing, the kind of positions he likes playing against Sergey and the kind of positions he thinks he's better at um, against Sergey. And just regardless of the color, he went for, for those kind of positions. And that's where we saw Sergey struggle so much. So I think that gave a lot of sort of just the whole narrative with, with that insight from Peter just made so much sense. Today, I think, is going to be a different ball game. It's not going to be a one-man one show at all. Exciting chess coming up. I am really looking forward to it. And it doesn't stop here, Jan. I need to breathe, but only after this one. So, of course, we've got day two of the first set of quarterfinalists, but also it's day two of our big quiz. Uh, we had the four-part quiz where the mega prize is this absolutely stunning chessboard worth 1,000 euros designed by the 12th world champion, Anatoly Karpov himself. Now, these quiz questions are extremely difficult. We had part one in, um, we had part one day before yesterday. And now we, we've got our second day of it. Now remember at 5 p.m. again, go to chess24.com slash quiz. We're gonna be reminding you of this. The questions are going to pop up again and enter them. Good luck with it. Because as you can see, these were the three questions, Jan, that we had in the in part one of this quiz. And of course, we got everything wrong. I thought the answer to which country hosted the world championship match in which a Russian and American player met was going to be Iceland. But of course, that was a trick question. It wasn't. And it was in Cuba, in fact. So we're going to be announcing, I think, our winners of part one soon. But do not forget to enter at 5 p.m. Go to chess24.com slash quiz and Good luck with winning that beautiful chessboard. I'm just hoping that the questions this time are easier, Yan. And I'm going to breathe now. Your turn. I can't, I can't reproduce that. See, my voice is failing already. I can see the winners on my screen, though. So, con oh, now they disappear. Congratulations to the Bowtie Club. The others are gone, but I'm sure you guys have seen it. Maybe we can bring them up again. Um, yeah, I'm not that great in chess history. I wrote all these Kasparov, my great predecessor's books, and of course everything I could get my hands on as a kid. But these questions are way over my head. So it's the Bowtie Club. Then second, F-H-I-L-M-I-K. That's a beautiful username. Just rolls off the tongue. Filmic and Screws07. So which world champion also won a world amateur chess championship? Max Uwe. All right, didn't have any idea. Which country hosted the World Championship match in which a Russian and American player met for the first time? Cuba. I had a suspicion, I think we talked about this, that Steinitz yeah. might have become American because I knew he moved there. I'm not sure if he took the citizenship. But yeah, Havana in 1898, 1889. Three longest matches in the history of World Championship matches. Okay, those I guess one has to Google. <clears throat> And we are being joined by a man who does not only know chess history, but also chess present, chess future, chess theory, like no other. The legend from Saget Hungary, Peter Leko is here with us. Peter, how are you today? Yeah, hi, Jan. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine. Thank you. Good to hear. How are things in Hungary? Are you going to the grocery store? Are you sitting at home? What are you up to? 
Well, that's uh, that's my wife Sophie's job. She is the one who, who is keeping the the front line uh, in our house. I'm basically just uh, working on chess, following the show, commentating, and fighting. That's my life right now. Sounds. I don't know if it's tough or good, um, but it seems like you're doing well. What are you expecting from today's matches? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I think it's uh, something really special because we we haven't seen such a scenario, right? That somebody has just lost a match, but it's not the end and he has a chance to come back. So in this sense, I'm really very interested to see how the participants will deal with this new situation, this new challenge. I mean, let's suppose, for example, Levon Aronian. He seemed to have dominated the first match against Hikaru, but finally he lost that match. And is it not the right strategy to change something or should he just stick to it and think that, okay, I have done everything right? It's, it's very tough. I'm very, very curious to see how Hikaru and also Levon will uh, adjust today their play. The same applies to, to Dingley and versus Yu Yanji because I felt like maybe the match was a little bit peaceful. I mean, uh, between the two Chinese players, of course, it was a lot of fight, but it felt like they don't really mind uh, uh, going into the Armageddon. Uh, but now after losing that match uh, against Yu Yanji, I think Ding Liren has the feeling that most probably he should try to make more use out of his white games. Maybe he should take more risks because Armageddon is uh, maybe too risky against Yu Yanji, who, who seems to be faster with the, with the mouse. Yeah. I think I fully agree with Peter here. I think what happened in Yu Yangi's and uh, Ding Liren's game was very clear that, uh, like you were saying, it was extremely peaceful, but Yu Yangi was the better player in the Armageddon. His pre move game and playing very fast while Ding Liren struggled with it. Um, and he, which means that he probably does feel that Yu Yangi has an edge over him going into an Armageddon. So if he's got to do something, it probably should be in the rapid phase. I'm yeah, curious, as a student of basketball there in these playoffs, where it's also a system, normally a best of seven, but it very often happens one team wins the first game and then they relax a little bit subconsciously in the second game because it's not as much do or die for them as for the other team that is desperate to come back. Do we feel maybe Aronian and Ding facing elimination, they will be more motivated today? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. However, I think in all these sports, uh, we have the so-called home advantage, yeah? And uh, basically, it's often that uh, the teams who, who play at home are winning, and it's kind of logical that the next match at home soil, uh, the, the team wants to give everything in front of the home crowd, and thanks to the home crowd, they are beating the team. So. I don't know Basketball exactly is two matches on the opponent's court usually, the first two. Exactly, so. yeah. That's what I wanted to say, that yeah, I'm not an expert in, uh, in the NBA, but yes, I, I recall that, yeah, that's the situation. So maybe this argument is not entirely correct, but uh, it's, a, it's a valid point. I mean, uh, Ding and uh, Levon are facing uh, elimination, so it's, uh, they have to do everything, they have to give everything. And also Hikaru said, you remember that when it looked like in the third game he was uh, struggling and it felt like he might lose that game, he also took it a little bit more philosophical that, okay, it's not the end of the match because after all, he has a chance to, to come back the next day. So very interesting format. I think it's also a completely new psychological challenge for the players. I love the format. I love the format too, but I have to say it feels like a bonus because these players are so used to just the fact that if there's a knockout, you get one chance, you give it your all. And if you uh, don't make it, that's it. But here it's just, it's, it's totally brand new that they've got actually three mini matches to play. So which means a player has to win two out of three to qualify to the semis. So the fact that they have another shot at this, I think it's a very positive thing and not an added pressure. Uh, also, specifically about this particular quarterfinal that we saw last time, it just felt like all four players did give it their all. It's kind of hard to say where they could have felt, you know, this is where I fell short. And uh, I just think it's an absolute bonus to have another shot at trying for the semifinals. I think it's not an added pressure. And uh, we're just going to see what we saw on day one, which was an absolute epic struggle battle from all sides. Some got lucky in the Armageddon. 
I have mixed feelings about the format. I think it's nice that the stronger player is a bigger favorite to move on with these three matches. But I miss that at the end of the day, we have a result. Someone gets knocked out, someone moves on. And I sometimes read a little bit of confusion about how is this, but Ding lost he, and he's still in the tournament. What's going on? So we should probably keep explaining. It's best of three. So you have to win two matches to move on. Therefore, if Yu Yang Yi today wins, he takes a 2 0 lead and the match is over. Same for Nakamura against Aronian. If Aronian or Ding win, it's 1 1 and they play a third match to decide who advances. Before we advance with previewing the openings, we should thank the sponsors, the Lindores Abbey Heritage Foundation, which makes sure to preserve the legacy of that beautiful Abbey. Is it called Abbey? Yeah. That we see there on the screen in good old Scotland. I've never been, I think I've been to Glasgow once, but I haven't been to Scotland once. Much I'd love to go. So check out our friends at Lindoris Abbey. Then check out good old chess24.com. I think we have a new promotion where you can get two months of premium for the price of one. So that's a much, much lower price, of course, than the yearly premium membership. So if you want to have a look around, you know, challenge Magnus, he might do a banter blitz on one of these rest days. Check out all the video series if you have some time at your hands. Now with the code double on chess24.com slash premium. You can sniff into it, as they say. Speaking of Magnus on chesswill.com, his course, the Magnus Touch, is out on sale. So a lot of things you can do to support this Magnus Carlsen chess tour, which hopefully keeps all of us entertained during these somewhat strange times in the world. Peter. Chess openings. What do you expect from Levan Aronia? Do we expect more 1d4 discussions? Do we expect him to move to e4, to c4? Because we know what to expect from Hikaru, more or less. Yeah, I mean, actually, why I love the format so much is exactly because of the, all this speculation regarding the openings. Yeah, that what, what is the right strategy? How should they adjust? What they should change? I mean, I felt like Levan had no problems with the white pieces. But uh, for me, it was more like the question, will he continue experimenting with the Petrov or will he change uh, his Petrov? That's kind of my, my question because we have... We'll talk because Petrov looks shaky to me. I think if he plays the Berlin or the Marshall, he'd be so much more stable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, looking back at the match, Levon could have the feeling that, okay, why am I doing this to me with the, with the Petrov? On one side, I perfectly understand Levon because it's a very nice possibility to get good practice in uh, in the petal. At the other hand, it's it's now a knockout. So if he will be knocked out because of the petal, it's uh, it's I'm not sure he will be so happy with the experiment. So this is a big 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 question for me. And uh, otherwise, I don't believe that Hikaru will change something. I mean, he already had shown before the match. I mean, in the invitational that he sticks to this Queen's Gambit against D4. And if he would have liked to change, then it would have been logical to change before the start of their match, yeah? Now that he already played it, he has seen how Levon was reacting to it. I feel that most probably Hikaru will stick to his, uh, his main weapon. Yeah, I agree. That seems to be his strategy. Play the same openings with Black be tight there and try to put pressure with White depending on the opponent with E4 or D4. Tanya, not, what? Just, not just in this tournament, we saw that in the Magnus Invitational as well, the first uh, tournament of the of the Magnus Chess Tour, that uh, Hikaru was sticking to his openings. And I think I agree that we're probably not going to see a Petrov from Lev, and it would be, I personally am hoping for a Marshall, but uh, it would be a surprise if Hikaru doesn't stick to his openings. Also, I think it's not just Ding Liren who probably is uh, has realized after his first quarterfinal mini match that Armageddon is not going to be his strength. Similarly, I think for Lev, his best chances lie in the mini matches. So it's going to be very, uh, it's going to be very exciting to watch how they how they tackle the the opening. But I have to say, when it came to enterprising play and aggressive play and creativity, Lev did not let down. So I, I am really thinking that Lev's strategy will include going all out in the rapid uh, in the rapid portion of the mini matches. I think the shorter the time control, the more 
beast Hikaru gets. For sure. Then again, yeah. You gotta beat him two and a half to avoid that dreaded Armageddon. Peter, today is also every day we discuss the heritage of one of the players or the countries. Today it's Levon Aronian Day. I'm aware we had Armenia the other day, but today is specifically Levon. And I think you probably know a lot, not only about Levon, but also about people close to him, because of course he worked with Arshak Petrosian, as did you. You have a very good connection to Armenian chess in general. What can you tell us about Levon's upbringing? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, of course, I know Armenian chess very well. It's it's obvious. I mean, my father-in-law, Arshak Petrosian, is the captain of the national team already since the middle of uh, 90s or even earlier. And uh, I have been working with Levon for some time also in the past. Uh, I know the, the players very much. I mean, simply the, the point that in Armenia, people love chess so much. And uh, being a chess player, you are like a national celebrity. This adds always also to the pressure because people are expecting from you that uh, you do fantastically. But at the same time, it also gives a lot of, lot of energy for the players. So I think that's one of the reasons why the Armenian team could uh, do this miracle of winning three Olympic titles. I mean, it's just incredible. But whenever you see that team with all this uh, desire to win, uh, this, this incredible passion, team spirit, and they are giving absolutely everything for their country, it's, uh, it's something very, very special and very nice to see. For yeah. sure. Levon, in particular, he's given a lot of credit, not only to Arshak, but also to Gabriel Sargisyan, who has been a monster on these Armenian national teams. He's a very strong player in general, but usually when he plays for Armenia, all of a sudden he just wins all his games. Like I remember, I think, Dresden 2008, and he just started with, I don't even know, nine out of 10, something bizarre. There is so much pride with these guys and so much understanding, so much chest strength. It's very impressive. I think with, uh, with Lev, he just makes it to every, you know, every one of those lists of who is the nicest guy in the world top 10. I think Lev and Maxime have always been there. He is probably got the biggest fan following, not only because of what, what a genius and a creative player he is over the board, but also because of what a truly uh, humble human being he is. And uh, an extremely heartbreaking tragedy recently in his life when he lost his wife, Aryan. And I think that was, uh, it was something that the whole world were extremely felt very, very sad about. Of course for Lev, but also because Aryan herself was such an achiever and such a beautiful human being and just irreplaceable in every way. And just to see Levon to come back to the board and to give his best, I think chess is, it's just, uh, you know, you really feel for him and you really want him to do well. And I think chess is also probably now something that is uh, in a way, therapeutic and we, we saw it in in the nation's cup as well his performance there uh and now here and somewhere in my heart i'm really rooting for him there you go i'm wondering if you would take offense with being called a nice guy though i think he, he likes being a cunning guy as well but yeah he is beloved in the chess world that's for sure as kasparov said the chess world is a better place when levon aronian is playing well that's an old quote but i still feel it very much holds true so let's see how it so goes today to, because he yeah, has, also he has an extremely uh, unique approach to chess. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, of course, there's a competitive spirit and to win, but I think he's always trying to look for beauty in the board and creativity. I mean, especially in his classical format of play. And I think that also comes from his uh, artistic side and his general, uh, like his, you know, his core is where he loves, he loves music, he loves classical music, he, what, he knows a lot about many things, literature, and I think that sort of translates into his play as well, his, his search for beauty on the chessboard. Hmm. All right, I'm not going to argue. Um, no, I agree, he's a spectacular player. And speaking of spectacular player, we have lift off in Ding Liren, the world number three facing his compatriot, Yu Yang Yi, Ding with the white pieces, D4, D5, C4, D takes C4. The good old Queen's Gambit accepted. Where, who did Ding play this against? Was it against Yu Yang Yi? I recall a game in this tournament where he went DC5. 
What was the last round against Yu Yang? You know, Peter, I have bad memories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that was the fourth game. Yeah, this uh, yeah. this end game when uh, he had some chances, but finally Yu Yang managed to hold. So we have a Queen's Gambit accepted there. Solid opening. And I'm somewhat surprised Ding is not team 3e4, which most people consider even more aggressive treatment. But he sticks to his guns. And we were wrong. Aronia also sticks to his guns. And he repeats the Petrov. These guys, Petrov, this line with knight f6, knight f5, d6, symmetrical structure. As far as I can see, they're following a game Anishgiri against Caruana. Was that this stuff? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, something like that. Yeah, we have seen that in a Bundesliga game, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it was this decisive match between Baden Baden and Zollingen. Uh, I think also one of the, the reasons is simply that uh, Levon thinks, okay, hey, if I'm not continuing the Petrov, then I admit that it, it was a mistake and <laughs> Levon, Levon probably likes to be very principled. And uh, it, it, fits the, it fits the strategy. If he has, uh, also in the Nations Cup, he already played Petrov. If uh, basically his intention was to get this opening going, then it's, it's very logical. So yes, Levon and Hikaru is the first to deviate, yeah, with d4. Yeah. We've Instead seen battles C3. in knight c3, which looks stupid, but it's actually a very dangerous plan. You just want to go bishop e3, queen d2, long castles, and checkmate white if checkmate black if he castles kingside. D4, it's more mainline, mainstreamy. And it's interesting how Rowan goes for this bishop d6, because recent fashion has been more systems based around bishop e7, bishop f5, knight d6 in whatever order. Yeah, actually, there is something very interesting to it because I think Wang Kao was the person who was playing this Bishop D6 line a lot. And one could have assumed that during the candidates tournament, if he plays the Petrov, he will play with Bishop D6. But exactly, he was the one who changed with uh, Knight C6, Bishop F5, or Bishop E7, Bishop F5 against Jan Nyapomniachi. So it's, it's very interesting to see how these fashions are also changing and... Uh, yeah, players are always trying to bring up, bring some new system so that they surprise their opponents. Tanya, are you much of a Petrov player? What do you do against 1e4? I can't picture you playing the Petrov somehow. Not the Petrov, but I do have faced a lot of Spanish. I just go knight c6, not Berlin, but just uh, the proper Royal Affairs. Um, ah, I have so. actually tried to play the Marshal, which I've really enjoyed as well. And it stays in my repertoire. And of course, Lev is one of the martial experts that you have to study, including yourself, Jan. You've done a few courses on yeah, the Peter, martial. Peter has no clue about the martial, but uh, <laughs> I know a little something. Chessable.com slash Jan, my E4, E5 repertoire. Check it out. I'm kidding. Peter, of course, for many years, was the world's foremost martial expert, probably still is, and chess fans might want to check out this game that Peter Leko won against Vladimir Kramnik in their 2004 World Championship match in the Marshall, which I have very fond memories of, maybe not as fond as Peter. But I was with Peter Heine Nielsen, another Peter at that time, and we were doing live betting that was possible in those days. And the computer, those were weak computers in 2004, like I don't know what, where it was, like Fritz 7, somewhere along those lines, it was giving like plus two for white. But with our deep martial understanding. We could see, ah, maybe that's not the end of the story. Peter actually has a nice chance here. So we went all in and we were getting like 10, 20 to one for our money. And Peter made us some money or made the other Peter some money that day. So that was, yeah, beautiful game and good day for us too. It's funny, it's funny that you mentioned that because right before, literally right before coming on the show, I was, uh, I had an, in, I was interviewing Kramnik for another project and we were talking about his world championship matches and he said, uh, he mentioned that actually for him, the toughest one was his match against Peter. It was just so difficult to win that match. Also because what, li what line was it, Peter? Hardest uh -huh. players to beat ever. Yeah, well, I mean, you are already too much into the DC line, so you are playing Bishop F5 automatically, yeah? But after ah, sorry, D4, sorry, yeah, Queen yeah, H4, yeah. Queen H4. <laughs> yeah, GC, of Queen course. H4, Rookie for G5. And and here this Queen F1 caught me by a big surprise. And uh, yeah, okay, we don't have to see the whole game. I think the P 
people usually know or if they want, they can check it out. Yeah, it was truly fascinating. I think one of the problems with Marshall these days is that you don't get to play the Marshall because they will simply not allow you. Or if they allow the Marshall, they will play this CC-DC line, which is very, very drawish. It's, uh, it doesn't let black players play in the true Marshall spirit. So I think that's kind of one of the, the reasons why we see less martials now than we used to see 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, they're, they're trying to take the fun out of it. Still a good opening, though. So it's very sad if we lost Levan Aronian to the Petrov. Let's see how he does today. So far, it seems like Hikaru is displaying his preparation. He still has 16 minutes on the clock. And Aronian... Has yeah, here there is time. something interesting. Yeah, that Levon basically willing to depart uh, from his pair of bishops, right? Yeah, knight h4. I'm wondering how this Geary game went. I can't quite recall, but I think it was maybe it was something like this, right? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. But here, then suddenly, after rookie one knight d7, knight h4, the knight on e6 is hanged. Ah, but yeah, it's. It's probably awkward, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least there are some differences and that's why Levon decided to, to sidestep the preparation. Yeah, the big question is, can you take the bishop and keep the pair of bishops uh, or, or it's not possible? Also, guys, enough like talk about this Petrov and Marshall because there's a really strange opening that's happened in the Ding Yu Yangi game. It's a Queen's Gambit accepted, but not a very familiar opening not a very familiar variation yeah we'll get there in a second here it looks like hikaru weighing his options if he can take on f5 or if this does not give him enough because uh, the bishops get exchanged let's see if ding got something so all of this is well known a6 bishop e2 is not the most popular move but it's popped up recently i think live on Aronian himself actually is a pioneer of that move when sometimes the bishop wants to go here to make it to f3 later on after some d takes c5. And sometimes after cd, Levon has actually also just been playing et and then going for some knight e5, bishop f3 plans. So bishop e2, bishop e7 by Yu Yang Yi. Somewhat surprising. No, Peter, because conventional thinking is usually you don't want to move this bishop so early because then you lose a tempo after dc5 when you have to recapture on c5. Yeah, on the other hand, we see in the game that uh, Yu Yanji saw that now after dc5, I can castle. And uh, that's exactly, I think, what caught Tanya's eyes, that this one that white plays b4 and then e5, b5, yeah. this, this kind of structure we really don't see too often in this uh, Queen's Gambit. Yeah. b4 covers the pawn. But Yu Yang Yi breaks up that pawn chain immediately by a5 using the fact that a3 runs into a takes b. This rook would be hanging. So Yu Yang Yi will regain the pawn here. And Ding obviously has not missed this a5, but he's arguing that the pawn on b5 will cramp black a little bit. Yeah, I'm not, not, sure not only that, yeah, but knows. after knight c3, he's hinting towards knight a4. And he wants to directly attack black on the dark squares, try to use the b6 square or the c. Uh, the ace, the fa diagonal for the bishop if the bishop will retreat to e7. So that is it though. Let's say I go just knight bd7. I don't yeah, really I go knight it. a4. Show e7. Yeah, and how are you gonna untangle yourself? That's kind of my question. I, I don't mean, feel I go bishop that tangled b2. to begin with. Mm. Perhaps you could also go knight d4 in this position instead of bishop b2 against b6. Or yeah, but I want b6 waiting anyway. Waiting for b6. I can yeah, smell waiting it. for b6. Because if I go knight d4, black can maybe play knight b6. I mean, I did not want to give that option. So you want to go knight d4 after he goes b6 because c6 becomes weak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you already have to play some knight d5, I feel like, I don't know exactly, but I feel there might be something for white. I mean, I might just follow with rook c1. Yeah, still a little behind in development. It's one of those where yeah, if black solves those problems, they are completely solved. But if you don't, it could get awkward. <laughs> yeah, I can even <laughs> just play some queen d2, maybe also yeah. bishop a3. Yeah. I mean, it seems uh, that it's a very interesting uh, approach. And uh, also look at the clocks. I mean, queen's gambit accepted usually is the one that 
you can rely on your feelings and you will make sure that the first 10, 12 moves you will play automatically. And here we see two experts and they are burning time, showing that they managed to surprise each other. Yeah, this whole sequence, especially with seven feels improvised to me, so I don't trust it. And B4, A5, B5, yeah, it's a very rare idea, these structures. Reminds me, in my younger years, I played a lot of B4, E6, and somehow I always thought this was completely ridiculous for white, but this pawn really, really bothered me, because it's taking these squares. And now that white also has a bit of a stake in the center, it's an improved orangutan. Yuyang Yi goes for queen d1, rook d1, and a4, fighting against this Pideleko idea of knight to a4. Oof, ambitious. Yeah, I mean, it already shows that, uh, yes, black felt like he needs some drastic measures, because it, it feels like this, this gives white some extra options with knight e5, bishop f3, as you already mentioned. <clears throat> but, yeah, now white also has some problem, because how to develop the queen side? Where should this bishop from c1 move? Because bishop b2 can be met by a3. Very, very interesting position. What is it with all these a and h pawn pushes? In every game, we see some side pushing their pawn up the board. Like, <laughs> what happened to the good old rules, Tanya? Center, develop yeah. the pieces. The flank, flank is the new center now. Don't like it. Yeah, but in this position, to be fair, the center disappears. So if somebody wants to push something, he is forced to do it on the flanks. Yeah, Only the pieces can move towards the center and yeah, knight e5 played. Obviously, white is hinting to these knight dc, knight c4 ideas. And bishop fc is coming. So it looks a bit dangerous for black. Yeah. It looks like a very pleasant ending for white, actually, because black is still not finished his development. And it's not very easy for black to actually finish development and get any play. Knight d7. Yeah, and I guess knight c4 is the critical move now, heading towards the d6 square. Yeah, you don't want to trade knight c4, idea knight d6, yes. And you want to kind of get a double bishop advantage. So is knight d3 also an option? Sure. These yeah, I was just are worried deceptively that, tricky for black. That maybe this knight on d3 can be misplaced. Yeah, after knight d3, you go back to e7. And I feel that this knight on d3 is now not that effective. Right, knight c4, knight d6 feels like the right square for the knight. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even have to rush knight d6. No, but look at Ding anymore. went for knight d3, so he must have yeah. something concrete. In and now does bishop f3 to stop this b6? Yeah, no, no Ding he goes, goes for, for e4. e4. Yeah, we've seen this plan from him in game four the other day as well. No, he likes e4 and pushing the e pawn in these structures, which, yeah, as grinders, we normally prefer shuffling the pieces around, no, knight c4 and try to get some squares. But Ding has aggressive intentions. Z point here, which is more typical. There's still queens on the board. Yeah, it feels like a very ambitious approach. Yes. And by ambitious, Peter Lekomai means unsound and reckless. <laughs> Pawns never move back, Ding. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, imagine if White can put the bishop on easily, then he's almost uh, strategically winning. No, I mean, then you control all the squares, so black has to be careful and black has to make a very, very important decision right now. The point is that how to meet knight c5, it would run into the pin with bishop a3, right? And if you go knight b6, then you have some other, other issues. Yeah, very. maybe I have them bishop e3, knight c4, bishop c5. I don't know, yeah, a lot of, lot of things to, to calculate. Also, I'm looking at this line, Peter, knight c5, bishop a3, is knight e4 an option or no? Probably doesn't work in the end, yeah? So knight c5, bishop a3, knight e4, bishop e7, knight c3, bishop f8, and knight e2, you've got king f1. Yeah. Hang on, but guys, I mean, what are we talking about? Sorry, I was... Yeah, knight c5, stuff. bishop a3, and then knight e4. Oof. It's a very good point that, yeah, it's a lot, it's of, a lot of calculation required. And you this take on f8? Like, <laughs> no, bishop f8? Maybe just knight d1 here. Is but then I trap your knight with bishop b4. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Always look for one more move. And knight e2 runs into king f1 and then ah, knight c3, rook c1. Yeah, continues, but probably not what black was looking for, no? 
Yeah, it might be five. We're in exchange down. We have some pawns. But, but you you still want to play knight c5. But if you have to play knight c5, you've got to find something against bishop a3 because otherwise knight c5 is just asking for disaster, no? And meanwhile, well, talking about you disaster, you can still play knight fd7, but it shows very good nerves or very precise calculation because getting voluntarily pinned like that. But okay, if it will work, you will get the chance to play some b6, bishop b7, then it could be fine. Yeah, e4 makes the stakes way higher all of a sudden. And Yu Yang Yi will take a while here. He's already down to six minutes, 50 seconds. So if it was White's move He's right now, effort. White wants to play e5, right? Probably, yeah. Although, just developing doesn't look horrible. No, but should be three or should be four, rook c1. But yeah, e5 is looming for sure. Yeah, it feels as if Black needs to do something. Nah, Hugh doesn't care. He's studied enough Lila zero games. <laughs> he just goes pawn to a3 and worry about nothing. Yeah, or maybe he played a3 because he's very much worried. We don't know. <laughs> you done. It's a typical scenario. I mean, this AC looks like uh, it's the move that he did not consider for a while, but after seeing that all the natural moves have some problems, then he's searching for a third or fourth alternative, and that's how you end up uh, playing AC. Because, yeah, really, e5 is an idea, and also bishop e3, two nice uh, ideas for white. Okay, let's look at the most direct e5. How is black reacting to e5? Yeah, that's a big question because, okay, there are two options, knight d5 or knight e8. But, uh, okay, knight d5 would spoil the structure and knight e8 would be too passive. I think you go knight d5, no? <laughs> yeah, takes, takes, bishop e3. Yeah. I don't know what you... One. Yeah, I have no idea. But, I mean, bishop e3 was also so... Charming and uh, being. It's been played. He's going to bishop e3. Yeah, he didn't want to waste too much time. He has not time advantage. Four minutes, ten versus six, and the promising end game. That's exactly what Ding needed. So bishop e3 also stops any knight c5 trade offs, and e5 is always in the air. It looks very unpleasant for black. Yeah. And basically, by bishop e3, white doesn't mean that he will not play e4, e5. He just shows that, okay, my friend, you did not want to play e5 yourself, which probably means you still don't want to do it. But then what is your move? And finally, e5 is played anyway. Yeah. yeah. And this makes me also wonder, Peter, if in the previous move, white probably had an opportunity to go e5 there. Because that... Yep. Yeah, but that's exactly the psychological game, right? That Black could have played e5 instead of a3. He went for a3, so it means that he doesn't want to play e5, then I'm going to go bishop e3. That's the mind games that you are never sure of during a game. Yeah, super. So what can Dr. Ding do now? f4 feels like pushing it a little bit. EF, Black still has this square. G4? G4, anybody? Wow, you are very aggressive, yeah? Mm. I don't know. It's not my G4. Yeah. Okay, I guess so I have often. to play I have to play H6 and you're going to continue with H4. I have to, not I have to, but I could argue for Knight H7 maybe. Yeah, no, I was hoping I could do something with Knight D5 or G5, HG, Knight D5, but... But knight d5, probably I think black could take on h4. Yeah, I didn't see a breakthrough. All right, no g4. No, I mean, even uh, you are right, uh, you're gonna move like g4 is interesting, but it feels like uh, most probably think we'll not go for it. Hmm, that's very polite. Um, rook c1. In the other game, I, I have to ask you, I mean, I. I think Black's doing fine. White's got these two bishops, but it just doesn't feel enough in this position. It reminds me of Marshall, actually. No, Jan, look at this endgame. I always try to avoid these endgames against the two bishops, but yeah, it does not look like much for White. Yeah, but White doesn't even have an extra pawn in this case. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if if this was a marshal without the c6 pawn, we wouldn't be very happy. Normally, to get the two bishops, you have to return the pawn. But I don't know. It feels like black is okay, you know, with control over the f4 square. Hmm. <clears throat> That's yeah, I mean, the point is, the comparison with the marshal is that if we would take this f3 pawn and put it on b2, that's yeah, exactly that's what we marshal. could be getting, yeah. and those are those were the positions which were supposed to be very nice for white, but with the pawn on f3, which is quite a weakness, and also the, the c3 pawn is now very loose, yeah, so this knight on d5 is very powerful, the dark square bishop is very strong, and if whenever white will in the future play c3, c4, then the dark sweat will be really weakened. So it, it also feels to me like black should be fine. I agree. Yeah, it doesn't look like black should have too many problems. And I think for, for Lev, that's, that would be a good start if he's able to sort of balance, balance the situation out in the first game to try with the white pieces um, is always a good strategy. Yeah, can we just take a look how did this white pawn go to f3? I have a suspicion how it got there. Mm. Voluntarily. Uh -huh. Okay, f6. it's basically a set choice, yeah? It's not, not something you really want to do, but it feels like you have some concrete problems, yeah, with the knight jumps. To stop some rook 8 knight e4, yeah? Yeah. yeah. But I also think, uh, Jan, uh, this idea of knight d5, knight f6, knight d5 is really nice by Lev, because knight f6 threatens, you. it's not easy to always move your pieces backward, but very nicely found how to sort of um, simplify the position and liquidate it further. To go back knight f6, threaten rook e8 after h6, post the rook trade, and then come back to d5. I think it was nicely played. Beautiful. It's G3, actually typical, typical for the marshal, this knight f6, yeah? When you are fighting for the e4 square, and once you achieve that, this was exactly my game against Kramnik, yeah? That he had a rook on e4. I had to go knight f6 and kick this rook as long as finally he took it, and then my knight moved back to d5, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Mm. So Levon, although <clears throat> he's no longer technically playing the marshal, the motives are still with him. And yeah, this position will not feel alien to him at all. Yeah, and as already Tanya pointed out that Levon likes the, the beauty in chess. And I'm pretty sure that during the game, he, he has already seen this comparison right from the beginning. And now he goes for b5. It's, uh, it's the move that you want to make. It feels like everything is fine for black. You can take Levon out of the opening, but you can't take the opening out of Levon. <laughs> B5, Queen E2 played. Queen D7. It's also a very typical martial formation. You put the pawns like this. And then you do nothing and you tell white. Good luck breaking through after C4. This knight will be eternal. After a4, I will go a6. What do you want from me? And I actually think those positions, if black does, if white does trade the knight on d5 for the bishop ever with taking on d5 with the c pawn, could actually be slightly better for black because of the pawn structure as well. Yeah, you never take unless you have to, I would guess. Because black can't do that much either, right? Normally he wants to go h5, I don't know, bishop f8, g6, and sit and wait. But yeah, egalite. Yeah, and uh, Ding has played some very nice maneuver. I mean, rook a b1 prepared knight b4. I love it. It's very instructive. We are heading for the d5 square, and if the knight gets to d5, then this is looking really very unpleasant for black. Ding is so nasty with the white pieces, no? And in these half-quiet positions where he has a little initiative, he's really a role model for us 1d4 boys. He's so good. Yeah, and look at this. It seems like pressure. black is almost stalemated. No, nothing moves. This is such a dream, yeah. Yeah. You you can't play b6, you can't play knight c5, you you king e8 we run into knight d5. I mean, really nothing moves. It's terrible. Basically, Ding just completely outplayed you, Yangi, from the opening in this one. And I think Ding is just very, very angry from what had happened in their first mini match because of course. At least I cannot forget that Armageddon match, which he was completely crushing with the black pieces. 
Um, I can't picture Ding very angry. Like I can picture like a sad head shake or something. But do you think he yells at people? Like he throws stuff around? I just can't picture. I feel that's like the scariest kind, you know, like uh, people who from the outside just look like they're so in control and just so calm and peaceful. But of course, from his chest, it's pretty clear that he's an absolute beast and an absolute monster in reality. Um, I don't think Ding's the kind who screams on the outside, but I think on the inside, he's screaming. Yeah, yeah. And you remember, guys, that uh, we, we have seen that dramatic moment when he just lost and poor Ding couldn't uh, move from his chair for like three, four minutes. Yes, yes. Yeah, it I was, was heartbreaking. Yeah. Maybe just cramps. Mm, okay, unlikely. But yeah, this position looks crushing. I'm staring at it, but I still can't see a move. King e8, as Peter mentioned, knight d5. We have forks, and yeah. This is just very, very ugly for black. You feel like you want to resign. I don't even know what white's threat is, but give white some moves. He will come up with something. No, b6. Uh, knight actually, d5. one question that after rook b8, can white win with knight c6? Is that a beauty? With BC, BC, Rook B1, C7? Ah, no, because then you know, this I don't... Yeah, B, C7 brings nothing, yeah, okay. Yeah, that doesn't work, yeah. but... No, it, it would have been just too nice to, to finish with something incredible, but yeah, no, that does not work. Rook A5 played by A5 you. Played, yeah. And now... Does white go knight D5 anywhere? It's the kind of position where actually like white doesn't have any extra material, but just besides that advantage, it's got like all the pluses on the board are with white. It feels resignable, frankly, like it feels like something's gonna drop. This bishop is not coming out. I can't see it because here, if we try to exchange pieces, we also run into bishop b6, like yeah, this whole position is so ugly. But okay, I mean, once you go knight d5, then I can at least play, play some bishops, I mean, takes and play bishop c5. also asking for trouble no mm -hmm. it's terrible there must be some trick it's terrible but mm, even might be six yeah. i'm not sure i'm trying to win directly i'm sure there are other ways but yeah and knight d5 played yeah. might be six looks strong no i can't see a defense yeah that's a very nice movie on thank you thank you <laughs> takes takes yeah, but bishop c5 has to be played, yeah? But it loses. But why does it... I mean, after knight b6, at least I can take all these and play some king e8 or king e7. I mean, I wanted to go mm. king e7. It's oh. terrible, but I'm not... I mean, I'm not losing yet immediately everything, no? Yeah, it's true. The thing's down to two and a half minutes. I, uh, oh, the young is down to two and a half minutes. Yeah. What is Ding's clock situation? For some reason, I'm not getting it on R. It's six minutes. Yeah, so things really up on the clock as well. Yeah. Maybe knight b6 is not necessary. No, this whole position, it's so horrible. Just rook bc1, what do you ever do? Yeah, no, I... So now with b6, have, I will take. I don't have any move. Yeah, it's just a complete disaster. Yeah, not, no piece goes anywhere now. Yeah, and UNG went for rook a4. It's a neutral move. I mean, basically hinting that I'm very happy that I have find the move which does not lose on the spot. But after rook bc1, good luck finding another move that does lose on the spot. Come on, blitz out. Yeah. Ding is having fun. Of course, and now whenever this knight b6 will come, it will be a winning uh, move. So black has even less moves now than one move before, right? So actually now knight b6 is a real threat, right? Because you can't take. Because if after knight b6, just to demonstrate that if after h5 you go knight b6, knight b6 you just take rook d8. No, you first take on b6 anyway. And then you can't take on d1 because of rook c8. Or bishop d1. Yeah, actually I feel like the only problem white has not to blunder something in, in order to try to win it beautifully. So black just went back rook a8. This just demonstrates, I think, black's last few moves are just a testimony to what a horrible position he has. Domination. No, this feels like... 
in the good old days, some German under 15 tournament. If I had a weaker opponent with White, I would dream of having such games. And to do it against a world class player like Ding Liren is yeah, very impressive. This is just resigns. It's completely hopeless. Yeah, after King E8, White plays B6, followed by Bishop B5, right? And yeah. Peter, a student of Tigran Petrosian. Prophylaxis dominating, taking away counter chances. You will enjoy this position. No, you will play G3, H4, G4, <laughs> King G3. Yeah, and uh, mm. Dingley then went for Bishop C4, basically stopping any move by the Black Knight from D7. Black is completely pegged. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, as you already mentioned, couple of moves ago, it feels like resignation. It, it doesn't look premature to, to design. But <laughs> Yuan is not famous for designing, so he will try to put as much fight, but you, you can't really fight here. Yeah, the only so question for White is when do you cash in? Do you go for like the pawn or do you just? You can't bishop b3. Yeah. yeah. But I'm having sense. this feeling that since here it seems that the Ding is winning, maybe we should look at the Hikaru Levon game because White at least managed to, to make some progress. Oh, he yeah. broke the structure. Yeah. a4, a6, c4. He didn't follow my advice to take this pawn. Because uh, the a6 pawn would be weak. Yeah, yeah that's why it was so important to include a4, a6. Yeah, that was the, the key. Still, I'm curious if here we have no, no counterplay, like bishop b4 or something. But anyway. Yeah, Levon went knight c7, maybe believing that he will hold the, the structure, but somehow Hikaru managed to, to pose him further questions. BA4, it's not a move you want to play usually. And Hikaru does not recapture, but goes bishop c2, threatening checkmate in two moves. Queen h7 followed by king h8. Queen h8. Yeah, and I wonder if maybe Levon had missed this, because look at the clock situation. Now for quite some time Levon has, hasn't made a move, and his pawn on c6 is uh, losing now. Uh, I believe that he just thought that BA should be answered by bishop a4, then he goes c5 and he gets some kind of a blockade. But now if he loses the c6 pawn, it can be all over. Yeah, he does look worried. It is a must-win situation for Levon in this uh, mini match, mini matches of best of three. Uh, Hikaru won the first one after a very, very tense tie-break Armageddon game. But now in this one, if Hikaru does win today's match, he goes through to the semi-final. So Levon in a must-win situation. And of course, uh, this point is very important, even though he can potentially come back. But the first game of the day has a lot of um, psychological bearings as well. If Levon's not able to save this one, it's going to be tough for him to fight back. Yeah, especially if we consider him an underdog in any Armageddon situation. If he lose this one, what would mean he has to score two and a half out of three out of the next three, which would not be simple. And so Queen let's G5 see what he comes up with. Queen g5. Yeah, Queen g5. Yeah, Levon done to 29 seconds. Yeah, this is very, very scary. But the question is, how scary is his position? Will he get good counter chance? I mean, okay, he has some knight f4 check ideas. It's just and Levon though. shaking his head. Is Queen c6 not working because of knight f4? I mean, I, knight f4 is a check, but what's the follow-up after a move like king f1? Yeah, I don't see the follow-up yet, but there is also a question, should maybe white include c4, c5, kicking the first away this bishop from d6? I c5 mean, black's position attention. looks terrible. Yeah. Yes, c5 is, uh, is quite an improvement to put before you take on c6. His point is takes, takes, yeah? Must be. Yeah, here probably. Not yeah. sure if this works. Does it work? Check. He wants bishop to take here, so bishop f2. D6 hangs, right? And, hmm, now I was wondering if we can make some, Ooh. some miracle happen. I mean, this looks like King, this Even looks this like might lose it. for some so reason. Yeah. Three, C6, yeah. Yeah, know. but Hikaru did include C5 first. Just looks lost for play. Yeah, and down to 10 seconds and where to put this bishop? What have you done, Levon? That escalated so quickly. C5, bishop, c7 played. Played with two seconds on the clock. Wow. 
Oof. Yeah. Bishop takes a four. Right up. And it, it comes back to the whole martial conversation as well, that actually this knight on d5, you don't allow it to be kicked out very easily with c4. That's one of the very thematic ideas. So it's um, um, after white got a successful c4, I think it all just fell apart for black. Yeah, I'm still wondering if he could have gone bc4, bishop c4, and now found some resource. I'm not sure what it is, queen a7 or bishop b4 or some trick, because allowing this, what happened in the game, just looks horrible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, somehow it, it feels to me that maybe Levon got fooled by the fact that it looked like a very good marshal. Yeah, I mean, and he just thought that, okay, he can play routinely, and once he got faced with some problems and... Uh, then all of a sudden, the things started to, to fall apart. Seriously, though, Levon, he has all this martial DNA, and you don't even need to, but after C4, go B takes C4, no? Like, how bad can it be? But he loses a pawn, yeah? Nah, I'm sure there's something. B C4. Queen A7 doesn't work. Queen A8, yeah? What about A5 here? Hmm. That's too queen talented seven. for us takes and queen a seven. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> you have queen d2 though. Yeah, but then bishop e5. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, but uh, it simply the, the problem was that uh, he, I think he was not uh, mentally ready to have any problems. And uh, that's why after C4, he kind of, you remember also yesterday when, uh, as Hikaru also mentioned that uh, when Levon so-called gave the exchange or sacrificed the exchange or missed it, then he continued with his poker face. Was it maybe the same that here Levon felt like something went wrong, but let me continue quickly in order to signal my opponent that everything is under control. It, it could be the same situation. Yeah, but he's really shaking his head right now and he knows nothing's under control anymore. No poker face there, yeah. Just sadness. Yeah, no, not anymore, of course, yeah. But the thing is just mating you, yeah, with rook d7. Yeah, rook d7 played. Bishop f6. Yeah, they won. In the meantime, he's losing all his pawns. Mm -hmm. Queen f5 track played. No, it does look like, yeah. That's it. Dingley yeah. won his game. Because there was no defense against Rook H1, Rook H8. Wow, nice finish. Very nice finish. That was a crushing game. Big victory by Dingler in, in his must-win match. Uh, he has to either win it by a minimum margin of two and a half today or win it in the Armageddon, whatever he does, if he fails to do so. And if Yu Yangi wins today, that would mean goodbye to Ding's journey in this tournament. So very, very important and a very strong start by Ding. Also sort of setting the tone psychologically that this was not just a victory, it was a, cr a crushing victory. And Nakamura has also won. So both games end with wide victories. And this will be a heavy, heavy blow for Levan Aronian to recover from. Because yeah, I don't know. Sorry if I keep beating that point into the ground, but here to not go BC4 is just so strange to me. And then later yeah. to play B takes A4. No. Doesn't yeah, I feel like the level we know. I somehow had this feeling that it was based on this blunder with B takes A4 because he probably relied that he will have this uh, C5. Yeah, it's not ideal, but somehow he tries to then D5, he jumps with the knight somewhere and he sets up the blockade. But this bishop, G bishop c2 was just brutally strong. Yeah, I think you're right, Peter. Maybe he just missed this bishop c2 move because it's uh, easy to miss it. You just expect bishop a4 and then you have all these ideas. But bishop c2 just works beautifully for white. And uh, kudos to Hikaru again to find all of this and to find his chances in this game. He's really, he's really in form. You can feel his power and throughout, even in the first event of the Magnus Invitational and throughout the round robin in the Linderis Abbey, uh, yesterday's comeback. Absolute monstrous play by Hikaru. I read this somewhere. I think it was uh, Douglas Griffin who tweeted that Hikaru will not be disappointed if classical chess never made a comeback. 
Who knows? But yeah, he's certainly thriving in this format. Queen f5 check. Why did Levon resign? Not gonna defend this position, but is he... Not ah, just because he's losing the c6 pawn here. Yeah? Go to king check, let's see. Yeah, just queen c8. Yeah, I mean, it's just hopeless. Yeah, just everything falls. Yeah, no counterplay. Mm -hmm. All right, so two dominating white victories. We will have our usual couple minutes break. Usually the games resume within 10 minutes from each other. I will go get myself some fresh coffee and maybe we can play some clips. Be back in a couple minutes. Chess is simple. You just make the right moves. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Move Trainer empowers you to go from the opening to the end game with confidence. It's a seamless, effective, and fun way to study chess. Choose from one of the largest online chess libraries in the world, with hundreds of titles ranging from classic books through to our exclusive Chessable courses, including over 100 free courses. Get expert insights from International Master John Bartholomew, Grandmaster Sam Shankland, International Master Christoph Silecki, Grandmaster Simon Williams, World Champion Magnus Carlsen, and hundreds of other instructors. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts at chessable.com. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Now anyone can learn and improve their chess skills with the world champion, Magnus Carlsen. The Magnus Trainer app is packed with fun mini games and interactive training content. Playable anytime, anywhere. Get the Magnus Trainer, available in the App Store and Google Play. E5, it's E5, Patsers. A complete repertoire against 1E4, based on 1E5, now available to study with Chessable's unique Move Trainer technology. The backbone is the Marshal Gambit against the Spanish, with 3 Knight F6 against the Italian. Jan Gustafsson has revisited all these lines he has played for 20 years and worked on as a second for Peter Lecco and Magnus Carlsen, amongst others, with the help of the most powerful engines out there. Leela Zero and Stockfish 10. This has led to many new discoveries and a repertoire ready to master on Chessable that can serve the student for a long chess career. Maybe E4 doesn't exist after all. E5, it's E5, Patsers.
Let's not just look at openings move by move, but let's try to understand a little something and look at a few typical structures that can arise out of a bunch of main openings. And hopefully understanding these structures and the typical plans and the ideas will help you a little bit in your own practice. Laurent, what structures will we cover? So first of all, we'll, we'll cover the, one very famous structure, uh, Karlsbad structure, which can arise uh, from the Queen's Gambit mainly, but from other openings as well, like uh, the London system or the Karokan. Yes, uh, so, fond child of memories of the Karlsbad Thank you. It's important for everyone to understand what's going on here. Yeah, exactly. Then we'll have a look at uh, some uh, Rui Lopez, actually, which is a classical line, not the Marshall or the Berlin, but this classical position where White plays D4 and sometimes even uh, goes like uh, with the pawn on, on D5, or even, even sometimes taking on C5, we'll see some nice game of uh, Bobby Fischer here and some nice cup of game after d5. Here you will share your Russian upbringing with us. You have all the classical education in the Rui Lopez. Some nice examples there, hopefully. Then we move on to the French structure, which I don't understand particularly well, but this position has always intrigued me. Who's better and why? What are the plans? Why can white hope for an advantage? Is a space advantage such a big deal? And the French structure, can of course arise mainly via the French after moves like knight c3, knight d2, or e5. But we also have a small detour into the Karo camp, which is very similar, but not quite the same. I've always been intrigued by this because the bishop can go out here, bishop f5, and it's of course assist times for, for black, but uh, it's not, life is not that simple as we will see. And the last topic uh, will be the symmetrical positions, which can arise basically. Order, like the French exchange, French or Petrov, I'm showing right now, or even the Berlin, Berlin, Rocky one, where we will see an uh, unfinished uh, masterpiece from the current world champion Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, right. Symmetrical positions here, we mean these positions where either side is missing an e pawn that are very common in today's practice. So, this series is not intending to cover every pawn structure imaginable, but we hope we chose some that are instructive and relevant, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. Maybe even also. Welcome back, everybody. We have two matches today. Hikaru Nakamura against Levon Aronian and Ding Liren versus Yu Yang Yi. And Levon Aronian is now very much with his back against the wall. He lost the first game to Nakamura. He's lost the first match Let's face it, Aronian is on the brink of elimination here. He's now lost three games straight to Nakamura in this match. Game number four the other day, then the Armageddon, then the first one here. He's in trouble. Bileko, what can he do to come back? Yeah, it's a very tough psychological situation because these matches have their own psychology and you absolutely correctly pointed out that those games such as the Armageddon loss counts as well. And this is not really... Zero out of three, it, it signals that your opening is uh, taking over. You are getting more and more nervous. You are getting frustrated. You don't know what you are supposed to do. So in this sense, I very much feel that this is a absolutely must-win situation for Levon, not just because he needs to win, but he also needs to get back his confidence. And uh, if he is not winning this game with White, then uh, he might... Uh, have very tough time already in the third game of today's match. They're continuing their debate of the good old knight bd7. Queen's Gambit declined, which yeah, Nakamura has said. I am willing to defend the structure in every single game with mixed results, but it does seem like Hikaru is still convinced in the solidity of the black position. Don't ask me about this subtle. He says Queen C1 move is something Levon had played before. Was it in this exact position? I think so, no? I mean, Queen C1 is known already for a very long time, but uh, I think was also played against Hikaru in, uh, in this Magnus invitation already. So no surprise there, but I understand uh, absolutely why Levon sticks to this opening as well, because after losing so many games, it's very nice if 
with white you can have some risk free pressure and try to turn the tables by enjoying a little bit yeah and then maybe he gets the feeling back rook b1 he might also come up with some uh, very important idea i'm also not that familiar with all the all the subtleties here yeah rook to b1 both these guys are very familiar with the subtleties Levon Aronian as we mentioned the other day, has played this line himself. And I think it was even him who brought back this move c6 at the highest level to some extent, when most of the other guys were playing knight h5 or knight b4. Aronia said, no, no, this h6, b6, a5 is a pretty solid setup as well. And things are progressing quickly. Takes, 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 takes. Generally, black's position always looks fine, but it can be deceptive. If there's further simplifications, the c6 pawn is always the weakest pawn on the board. And the lack of space combined with the weakness of the c6 pawn can sometimes lead to problems. Therefore, Hikaru wisely does not go b takes c5, but goes for this typical rook a7, rook fa8, keeping his options open if b5 or b takes c5. And we also have liftoff in the other game, Yu Yang Yi versus Ding Liren. They are continuing their debate. Of this knight g2 nimzo tanya are you a nimzo player what what do you mm. think about this yeah we saw this earlier as well and we were talking about i think rook e8 was played instead of d5 in in that game and um yeah we had seen this but now we had d5 before rook e8 right yeah so yeah these ideas are uh, this is how i i don't really commit to rook e8 and then either you can develop with knight d7 or go c6 a5 knight a6 here, as we saw, that the knight is on f4 instead of g3 in that game. So that's, of course, a different structure as well. And uh, at some point, you want to go c6, knight e7. So we've seen that's happened on the board. And of course, this is uh, Tingleren with the black pieces. A very, very good start for his campaign in this comeback mini match, which he needs to win. Yeah, good old Karlsbad structure here with the white bishop sort of locked up in his own ranks on d2. The most common plan that white has is to one day go for play in the center with f3, e4 or expansion on the king side with f3, g4. But personally, I never like these setups that much for white. Peter, how do you feel about it? Yeah, in fact, I have the feeling that uh, Yu Yanji played this against me two years ago in the European Club Cup. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was this Nimzo 92, and I played the classical way with d5, bishop back to e7. And uh, he blitzed out also something like this knight c2. And I was spending so much time during the game just trying to understand what does he want. Then I played the most logical moves, uh, got a very nice position. The only, my only problem was that I burned too much time. And then finally, in time trouble, things escalated. The game anyway ended in draw. But it, it feels like it's, it's almost the same. So his plan is just that you burn a lot of time. Does not seem to be working because Ding Liren still has 16 minutes. Yeah, it's now also not a surprise, yeah, because uh, the first day Yu Yanji came up with this EC92 setup against Ding, but obviously Ding has done his homework and uh, if he decided to, to go for the classical setup, he must have checked it uh, seriously. Uh, are you checking now my game? Nope, but I can. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting because I believe it was very similar. Give me. Does Black want to normally go knight g6 or knight e6? Because um, I remember when I was playing these positions, I also really liked my knight on e6 instead of g6, and then to actually go g6 at some point. Yeah, but I think you also mentioned that you like the plan with a5, knight a6, knight yes, c7. Knight a6. Knight c7 and then knight e6. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that was the absolute classical uh, setup. I was also raised like this that a5, knight a6, knight c7, and it's perfect. But then suddenly white had some idea with the move orders. And exactly because of that reason, people started to, to switch to knight b7, knight f8 with the same ideas, but just uh, move per move, it was somehow working better. Right. And of course, the main idea is to not allow white to get a successful f3, e4, as Jan pointed out, by keeping pressure on the d4 pawn so that e4 is harder to get. Yeah. f3 played. 
Yeah, I FC. can't find that game of yours, Peter. Uh -huh. okay. mm. <laughs> F3, the, what I learned in German chess school is that after F3, you're supposed to go C5 because now E3 is weakened. So we can play for C5 and we do it before white goes E4. But does that apply to this very position? German chess school, you know, it's not the greatest of chess schools. Yeah, but in this sense, it's a perfect school, yeah, because that's that's what you are supposed to do, exactly. I guess I, I read it in a Russian book, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see if Ding goes for pawn to c5, if he agrees with that thinking. You could also make a move like, I don't know, knight g6 and argue e4 is not coming just yet. Yeah, e4 is just not a threat at the moment. Yeah. Because usually the whole point was that FC was settling E4 and then you are obliged to play C5. Now it's a little bit different. So Black might feel that, yeah, C5 is great. But on the other hand, uh, do I need it right now? Isn't my position just good enough? It's also some kind of a belief issue. I think that there are many people who simply believe that, okay, this is perfectly fine for Black. And there are some other guys who say that, okay, maybe I have no advantage with Y, but I... Just like it, it's a nice playable position. And Ding chooses door three. He says, you know what? I'll play pawn to g5. You, you guys and your cute talk about classical plans. It's all very nice. But where does this knight go if I just attack it? Whoa. The only square knight h3, but then that ruins the pawn structure. And this brings us to our conversation, or back to our conversation, that no c5, no play in the center. It's all about the flank play now. Flank is the new center, I'm telling you, Jan. It's still, it's incredibly concrete because even knight h3 was played, takes, pawn takes, even if white had time here to consolidate like king h1, rook g1, it'd still be very close to winning. But also, king goes queen d7, targets the pawn. How are you defending this pawn? Are you going, I mean, king g2 looks like the only way, but it looks like a move you don't want to make because of knight g6 perhaps? Yeah, that's the point, I think. King g2, knight g6, threatening knight h4 check. And if we take, we fix the black pawn structure. Very direct play. With the H pawn and then King G7, Rook H8, it could get very dangerous for White. Exactly. I mean, okay, this G5 weakens the light square, so White should try to make use of this F5 square, but it comes at the cost of a pawn sacrifice. Yeah, if White goes Knight G3, you can just take on G3 maybe and take on H3. Might be two pawns, no? Because I don't see how we keep this. Yeah, guy. how should to defend, one, yeah. Exactly. Knight H5, yeah. We're not on time. Okay, I have some rook f2, but yeah, it's already too speculative. Knight g3 played though, what else? And if takes, takes. Maybe this is what he wants. Yeah. And Ding only down to 14 minutes on his clock. I mean, he's taken less than a... Of course, there's an increment, but that's... That's barely taken any time to get this position with the black pieces. That's incredible. Ding is done messing around. Ding's done three. being the nice guy. He's now the bad guy. Wow. Did not expect a heel turn from Ding. Mm -hmm. And I have to remind everybody, this is the moment when you head to chess24.com slash quiz because it's 5 p.m. And the questions should be on the screen in case they're not when you get there, just refresh the page. Remember, it's not just about getting them right, but getting them right really, really quick. Because at the end of it, the grand prize will be calculated based on your end score of winning this beautiful chessboard designed by the world champion Anatoly Karpov. Each board worth a thousand euros, three boards up for prizes. So go on and enter. And I don't know what the questions are for the day, um, Jan, but... oh, I'm ready. They should be on our screen any minute. Yes, so question one, which world chess champion was the first to have a cameo appearance in a feature film? I know one who just had a cameo appearance in one of the big Netflix series, but no, that's probably not the right answer to this. He's also playing here. It's Hikaru. He's technically that's not a... Well, he's maybe a... Do we, he's not a classical world chess champion, at the very he's least. Not, but yeah, he's not a classical, but he has he has won the World Blitz Championship. I would guess that counts, but I'm pretty sure the question means 
classical. Awesome. So we do have confirmation. Also, Tanya, Billions is not on Netflix. Get your series straight. It's not? Facts straight. This is, uh, this is sensitive <laughs> topics to me. <laughs> Yes, you are the Netflix expert suggesting all the good Netflix shows. But for now, the question number two is in which world championship match was an electronic chess clock used for the first time? Wow, I've got zero idea again in any of these two questions. Which player played their first official game? Which player played their first official game in a world championship match? That Okay, I need to read that again. That question makes very little sense in my head. So it means their first like tournament game was in a world championship match. <laughs> wow! Wait, That'd like be an impressive savant, okay, no? Like, yeah. What? Which players? That's Stefan Zweig stuff, right there. Oh, which players? Maybe like they played against each other for the first time. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Which players? Yeah. Which players? <laughs> Got it. So which players played their first game against each other for the very first time ever in their chess career in a world championship match. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to any, any of, of those questions. Yes, we are not I can't winning. even recall a cameo appearance by any world chess champion in a movie. Peter, can you? What does it mean, cameo? Like a brief appearance for a couple of minutes, like a guest star. Uh, okay. I don't know. Like Bill Murray in Zombieland, if that helps you. <laughs> I don't know, actually. It's uh, you guys are very tough, yeah. Always with some. Did Gary make any appearance in any movie? Not I sure. haven't seen it. No idea. All right. Well, you've got an hour to enter this contest. Go on chess24.com slash quiz for your shot at winning this stunning chess board. Also, don't forget we are doing this every day of the event where you can tweet us your. Um, your chess heritage story. It could be just any memorable moment from your experience in chess, just uh, a funny moment, just anything that happened to you which has left an impact in you, your chess heritage. Tweet it to us. Don't forget to tag chess24 and hashtag chess heritage and the best heritage stories. We're going to pick up two of them every day, win some cool prizes. So tell us, what is your chess heritage story? By the way, I'm being corrected and I have to apologize. I'm being told that Billions is indeed on Netflix in some countries. So maybe it's just not it's in my India. German Netflix. So some of those countries have and one of them happens to be in there. It is true. I apologize. It's fine. Uh, somebody whose favorite show on Netflix is too hot to handle would probably not know much about Netflix. Wow, shots fired. I, I actually know that you've watched way more Too Hot to Handle than me. I did not like Too Hot to Handle. Love is Blind, I'm on board with Too Hot to Handle. Ugh, was too much even for me. But guys, there is so much action. Let's get back also to the Alonyans game. What happened there? Where is that game? I mean, uh, there was there was some action sacrifice and it looked fantastic for Black. I mean, game Black drawn. has no problems. Wow. And game is drawn already by repetition, yeah. Yeah, Levon, well, it looked tough to begin with, but he did not get anywhere of the opening. He played this plan. This is how they used to play in the old days, this G4 and then pawn to F4. But it always seemed like Black had enough to hold these positions. And here... Very interesting. Rook takes c3. Sort of forced exchange sacrifice, but it looks very strong too. Takes and bishop takes a5. Ba getting this fantastic square on e4 for the knight, getting the a file, getting a pawn for the exchange. By exchange, we mean rook versus horsey and pawn here. Yeah, no problems for black, no? Yeah, and here is the justification. Yeah, that pawns don't move back. With the pawn on f2, this action sacrifice would have never worked so well. But combined with this knight on e4, it's clear that white has to be happy to, to settle for a draw. Mm. And did we also have a result in the other game? No. Um, they're still playing, but it looked like Ding was doing well. So just to sum this up, Levon Aronian in real big trouble. He's down one and a half half against Ikar Nakamura. He would need at least a 2-2 and then win the Armageddon to stay in this tournament. And basically, if uh, Hikaru would win the next game, it's match over and uh, Hikaru enters the semifinals. That is correct. Yes. 
Yu Yang Yi is trying to also enter the semifinals, but he is down 1-0 today against Ding Liren, and it seemed like he was in trouble, or under pressure at least with the white pieces too. So let's see what happens. Yeah, but I told you guys, yeah, that this F5 square, it uh, should not be underestimated because, yeah, you are winning this pawn, but you damage your structure and uh, it can get very messy. But it's interesting that after knight g3, Ding decided to take on h3 and actually allow knight f5 instead of going for this line, Peter, that you were discussing with taking on g3 first. Yeah, but I mean, if you take, you cannot really take queen g3 because then I will go rook g2 and e4 against queen h4. That's, uh, that was my point. That's a nice point. Yeah, and I might get very active. I don't Is know how clear? it... Two pawns. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it's clear, but it felt at least very dangerous. I would play e5 and then I would curse after queen takes d4 and I'd be four pawns down. Mm. Anyway, it did not happen. They got an end game where Ding is only one pawn up. Only one pawn up and black white does seem to have compensation with his weakness on the light squares and his double bishop. He's definitely made his chances against that pawn that he sacrificed on h3. And he's just played knight h4. I don't like that move. We can take and then the extra pawn is a doubled h pawn, which is basically useless. King g2, king h3. White is better, no? What's going on here? Yeah, but knight h4 was kind of a sad necessity because white was setting rook g2, taking the g5 pawn for free, and there was no way to defend it. Oh. I, I at least haven't seen a way to defend. Hmm. Yeah. Rook g2 was a huge threat. You can't go h6 because of knight h6, and there's no way to defend. Um, the other horsey? And go f6? Okay. Not pretty either. Because yeah. then also, yeah. Actually, very instructive this queen f1 move, yeah, that by exchanging the queens, uh, suddenly white gets such a nice uh, kingside initiative himself. Second. Yeah, and I'm wondering in that position that you mentioned with knight d7, if after. Uh, Instead of knight h4, mm -hmm. rook g2, f6, if white can go h4 here. Yeah, it did not look very inspiring, I have to admit. Create knight h4. It's troubles. So knight h4 and then trade it off and white got e4 finally. I went e4 directly. So aggressive. Mm -hmm. This might be very good, but it better be. So if not, you could just, you know, have done this. Oof. Can black include bishop b6? Peter, calculate. Help us out. Can we take? Can we get, take your knight g4? What's happening? Yeah, well, I mean, if you really want to rely on d4, then you have to calculate a lot. In this sense, bishop b6 does look like an alternative, but it's also very, very risky, yeah? I don't like this e4 move. Feels wrong to me. I mean, you wanted rook g2 check and then what? No, I wanted king g2. Ah, king g2. Take the pawn. So greedy. Very much. But e4 also positionally. Let's say de doesn't work. I go, I don't know. No, no, but bishop b6 I is played. Bishop b6 is played. I think I like bishop b6 because after bishop e3, de, knight g4 is still not a is still not possible, yeah. But at least the bishop on e3 is under this e x ray rank, and you can take on e4. Knight g4 runs into rook g2, unfortunately, and then h3 comes. But probably you can now take on e4, and this bishop on e3 might be a problem. Yeah, this doesn't look great for knight d6, probably. Six, yeah. And then rook f3, you've got rook e3. Pinned e5 played by Yu Yangi. Yeah, I don't think you could have allowed d4. More questions. Bishop d4, I guess just ef is good for white. Looks good for white, no? So he but went. Could, yeah. No. Knight, yeah, h5, knight no. h5 played because bishop e3 runs into rook takes e5. So white cannot play bishop e3. And then what? Bishop c3 nice. runs into knight f4. Very nice. With rook e5, there's rook g2 check, right? Yeah, but I can sacrifice this exchange with pleasure. And then knight f4 anyway in the end. Yeah. True. Nice line. 
So what do we yeah. do? Bishop c3, we also take... Okay, you have some rook g2 check, rook g4 ideas, but e5 is hang... I mean, there are all kinds of questions. What I'm really surprised of, that all these very committal and difficult decisions, the players were almost blitzing out. This, this confuses me completely. So Dingler in eight minutes on his clock, and again, I can't see you, Yangi's clock. Um, Still nine minutes. Okay. All time. But basically, it meant that this middle game phase was almost blitzed out by both players. Yeah. And this completely confuses me, you know, because otherwise, if we would have, if they would have spent time, I would have had the chance to understand the logic behind their decisions, but. Right now, I'm not sure that all this was best or it was logical, whatever, it was more emotional. Hmm. Well, I think it seems to have worked out for Black because now White has got some problems to solve, no? Yeah. So Rook G2, because like uh, Peter pointed out, Bishop E3 is not a possibility. Bishop C3 is not an option because of Knight F4. So Rook G2 looks like White's only move here. Now rook g4. So there's you rook could e5, take rook e5 or rook g8 could also yeah. be an option. How does this go? Yeah, you have both options basically. But rook g8, probably you've got bishop e3 then. If takes, we take, yeah? Or what do we do? Yeah, takes, takes. Takes, takes. King h1 is actually a powerful threat. Let's say check king h1. Now the rook is under attack and it can't move because the horse is dropping. So rook g2 check king h8 plate. And, um, and now bishop e3 runs into the same line with rook e5, d5, bishop e3, king h1, knight f4. So still not possible. Bishop c3, and rook g4 has to be played on the board. Just no other move for white. Yeah. Yeah, very confusing. Very, very confusing. I mean, there is also some line like this rook g Rook, rook g4, rook e5, rook h4, I have bishop d8 or not? Is that a funny line? If rook h3, I go back bishop b6. That is very funny. I'm only mentioning it because of the fun factor. Yeah, there, it's absolutely <laughs> not necessary. But Leiko was... spots the move repetition. Immediately, yeah. <laughs> That's too much of a temptation, yeah? <laughs> that is cute. Um... I don't know. Yeah, if you go back, I can go back. And then I am I solved all my problems. Yeah. But my question is, do I have any problems? Which I'm not sure <laughs> at all. Yeah, rook g4 played, so we will see what's happening. So rook g8 or rook e5, two tempting options. What happens if after rook g8, white goes bishop e3? Also, you can maybe just play king h1. After rook g8? Yeah. Yeah, this is not a big threat, is it? It's not. Because the knight hangs and the f7 pawn hangs. Yeah, then suddenly white will be too active, I believe. Yeah, but even rook f7 is probably breaking through somehow. Yeah, this looks bad. Rook f7 and bishop e3, both are strong. And now after rook g8, so king h1 just... Renewing the threat of rook h4. Mm. Nice move. Yeah, feeling wise also, if you can take on e5, then take it, yeah? The question is, does it work or what is against? That's the, that's the critical move. Chat, help me out here. Ah, rook e5, there's also king h1, according to dark moon. Ah, uh, immediately sidestepping my repetition idea, yeah? <laughs> and if we go, I don't know where, let's say e6, then just takes, yeah? This knight is still shaky. f6. Feels dangerous, no? The bishops are so strong. Yeah, now it's, there are some mating nets, yeah? Looming. Yep. Speaking of looming, Bad segue, but I keep discussing this line where Van Aronian sticks to his Petrov. Game number three is on the way in the Nakamura-Aronian match where Hikaru Nakamura 
is up one and a half half. Also won the first mini match. So if Aronian loses this game, he's out of the tournament. If he draws it, he's going to have to win the next one and then win the Armageddon to stay in it. Aronian's chance is not great at this stage. As for the position, was this exactly the same line they had in game one? Okay, there I think they included knight b6, bishop b3, but uh, mm -hmm. everything else seems to be the same. Yep. So here, knight b6 was played, right? Yeah, similar business. White has the two bishops, which he can't manage to convert in the first game. We'll see if he can do it again. Somehow I also have the feeling that if uh, Levon is willing to repeat, I mean, giving up the, his light squared bishop, it indicates that he was not really frightened what happened in the previous game, yeah? I mean, we also had this impression that he had a very solid position. So by seeing that he repeats it, I feel, I feel like he, he indicates to the public that, yeah, it was based on a blunder, not on my position that I lost that game. Yeah, I think we also got that feeling that that loss was based on this mishandling of the C4 move rather than the opening choice. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, for Hikaru, it's also perfect. Yeah, I mean, he's in a very nice situation match-wise and this position consists of no risk. And uh, as the previous game has shown that, yeah, maybe black is fine, but after all, black is the one who has to be careful. Also, draw is not a bad result for him here, no? Like, he has not been under pressure with black last game. And even if he were to lose the next game with black, still the Armageddon, where he probably likes his chances. This looks pretty good for Hikaru Nakamura match-wise. I'm so distracted by trying to figure out which classical world chess champion was first in a movie. Still can't think of anything. It's very upsetting. Vichy must have been in some movie, no? <clears throat> you think so? I don't know. I know yeah. Alexandra Kostinyuk was, but women world champion. Ah, that counts. Maybe it's her. Does Maybe that it's count? another one of these. <clears throat> and in the meantime, Rook G8 has been played in by Ding, King H1, and he did ah. take on G4 and went Knight G7. Which I dismissed as looking sad, but maybe nothing else was there. But it does look quite sad, no? Yeah, it looked quite sad. On the other hand, it was not so easy to, to refute it move per move. That's why we kept on seeing that it looks very suspicious and that's it. Okay, let's make moves then. Take bishop d4, yeah? Yeah, I take bishop d4 and mm -hmm. mate me. I want to go e6 after bishop d4. Yeah, I'm gonna take it. Six, so aggressive. I want to, you know, keep my pawns. Mm. Which will you take, Peter? 96? Yeah, 96. King g8. No mate yet. No mate yet, but even if you just take on b7, it looks like it should be better for white. Not sure we have some. Yeah, dogs. I have no, some 95. activity. 95 is unfortunate, yeah. Yeah, people. I mean, you still have bishop a7 check, but yeah, I felt like then black should be fine with all this activity. And let's also not forget that whenever black goes rook f8, then all this rook f1, rook f2 check, counterplay can come quite fast. First yeah, h3, I... like Leila zero. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's back up. We could take on b7 directly. We could yeah. we could play the knit move, bishop c3. No, he does take. Rook takes b7. So no e6, rook b7 directly. So are you going to take on e5 now? You could also go rook e8, perhaps. But... He already took on e5. Yeah, he took on e5. Yeah, so now black is exactly one pawn up, yeah? So white goes king g2. Again, we have seen how effectively Yu Yanji can bring his king into the game against Magnus, yeah? In that brilliant game. This king is on his way to h6. Yeah, because that's exactly what black, black's problem is based on, that he's kind of stuck, 
Yeah, and thanks to the two bishops, the active rook on the seventh, the knight on g7 cannot really move, and this lovely pawn on g4 uh, controls also very vital squares. And this king march is very much in the game. So rook b8 had to be played, but it's kind of already also agreeing that, okay, I just want somehow some safety. I guess we take, take, and do something. What is black worth? This knight is pretty decent. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, Black is basing his play on. Yeah, this knight e6, knight f4. How to stop that? If white can stop that somehow, then white should be better, but not so easy. Oh. Really? I'm calling it. It's going to be draw. Mm -hmm. All right. So oh, he took on a7, not on. Ah, because rook b2, there's rook a8 check. Yeah, but then the rook comes back. Or the bishop, oh, yeah, probably the rook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if the bishop, then king h3, right? King yeah. h3 or king f3. Yeah. yeah. We can't take because and... the king has nowhere to go. So rook yeah, b8 played. Bishop f4 was in the air and 96 runs into bishop c3 in that position. So rook b8 on the board. No, at least it's he has a past eight point. But I like this better than the direct. Rook takes b8, actually. It's interesting stuff from Mr. Yu Yang Ji. Still draw. Yeah. Some hope. 96, 9, f4 coming, like you pointed out. Yeah, and these pawns c6, d5 are very powerful. Yeah, restricting white's light square bishop. That's why you also can't really stop knight e6, yeah, thanks to this good pawn structure. Mm. In the meantime, in the other game, simplifications have happened as well. Probably neither side against it. Aronia already indicated by playing the Petrov that he does not mind a draw and then taking his chances in the last game with the white pieces. And Hikaru probably also not against that idea. So this should end peacefully. Without too much drama, I would guess g6, rook e8, and all the rooks will disappear from the board. So we should d5. Yeah, a very comfortably equal position for black. And of course, it would have been very different had this been the turnout of the opening in their first game encounter, but that went horribly wrong in the same opening. Uh, this is definitely the kind of position that Lev was looking for for with the black pieces. But now, if, if they draw this game, that would mean Lev is in a must-win situation going into the last rapid game of the day, trailing trailing with 2-1. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's game. interesting we'll for me psychologically that we Lev on try to play for a win this position because it's very drawish, but on the other hand, it's absolutely safe for black. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, reasonings why black can continue playing. White is forced to push this d4, d5, and then we see the difference between the two bishops. And Black's bishop is much stronger, and I think Levon will be playing this. Also amazing clock situation. Levon with 15 and a half minutes, that's actually more than what you start with here, but you've got that 10 second increment, so he's actually kept his clock above the starting point. Um, Still... There is so much margin here for, for white that I'd be shocked if this didn't end in a draw, Hikaru. Yeah, Starts I agree. Starts by generating some square for his bishop. Rook c3, b6, bishop a4. Yeah, calling this a draw. And King g2, anticipating some rook f6 if needed. I guess you play rook d8. Ah, but white can actually go bishop c6, yeah? I was going to say, hoping for this. But I'm not sure who's hoping for this. Rook c8 played. Yeah, I mean, okay, probably the other game is now more exciting. They're both like a three on the excitement scale, no? Like from one till ten. Maybe this is a four, because it's check. 
Yeah, it's somehow also the players have three minutes each. Uh, there is already different clock situation and there is much more dynamics than in the other one, which is a purely tactical position. Here there are still some uh, interesting moments because, for example, can you go, most probably you're going to go knight g6. Mm -hmm. Run, and, a pawn. But or then knight e5 check. Ah, you're going to c4 here? Yeah? I'm gonna go to C4, yeah. Hmm. So even this is this safe for black? Maybe it is. Yeah, I don't know what it is. That's why I was also saying that no, no, I I think that this is uh, in a scale of ten, I would give a seven. Wow. Yeah. Seven sounds high to me. Also, oh, yeah. I'm wondering if after A4, black can just take on H2 instead. Not scared okay, of a5? I mean, at some point you want to give this one of your pieces for this pawn, and I'm wondering how. So 90, 95, King G2, unfortunately. Yeah, and if I get the bishop, I would assume I'm winning. <laughs> so 95 here, and I'm not in time to. Yeah, anywhere, let's say here. Here, then I probably have knight c4. Don't know if it helps, but. I mean, there is a check, yeah, bishop d4 check. Yeah. Bishop d7 first. Now this feels very, very shaky. This feels me. bad. Bad yeah. news for black. And a4 played. Mr. Yu Yang Yi understands if this pawn reaches the back rank, becomes a queen, or a rook, or a knight, or a bishop. But most likely a queen. This is not simple for Ding. No, not at all. And I would like to ask you, Jan, to, to explain me why you gave three on your scale. Because I did not see all the hidden excitement <laughs> that quickly. Now I would up it all the way to four and a half. <laughs> mm. A4. Okay, I want to be stopping and try bishop h2 one more time. So bishop h2, a5. Stop trying to make bishop h2 happen. Let's it's go not going to happen. Yeah, 95 check played. Okay, 95 mm. check played. Doesn't matter. It's too risky to go into this line just because uh, it's not my game. I can't be giving pieces. Um, knight e5. Yeah, another big question. Should we move to e2 or to g2 maybe? Maybe it's important to keep the pawn on h2, yeah. Yeah, he went king g2. Knight c4. Yes. Yeah, bishop d4 check. Here bishop d7, we start asking questions, no? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is also one other defensive idea from black that you try to exchange the dark squared bishop with bishop e5 after bishop d4 check. Yeah, knight c4, bishop d4, and then claim that I will sacrifice my knight for the a pawn and meanwhile I want to get king g5, h5 in and play for the wrong corner, yeah? That's... Uh, that's kind of a concept. I don't know if it works, move, pair, move, but... And then I go with the king. I forget about the pawns and just try to exchange this h7 pawn for the g4 pawn. Mm. So let's make some moves here. Yeah, then I go c5. No, then I go c5. I will not give my pawns for free. Uh, I, I thought you to said your king. you yeah. forgot about the pawns. Yeah, no, d4. Mm. I, I, I want them to, to disbalance you. They are, they are tilting me already. Anyway, I might still win. Yeah, you might still win because after H5, you also have H3 idea. So it's not yeah. like I'm exchanging, but that's why it will be so important to have those pawns that your king cannot move. It feels that it can be drawn, no? I don't know. Feels winning to me, but I trust your feeling more than mine. The other game in the meantime has been drawn. Yeah, very interesting. And imagine the players will have to decide with one minute or two minutes on the clock to... It's 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 more intuitive decision, but of course, back with very serious calculation. And bishop d4 played. And Ding goes king g8. Without even a thought. Instantly. Yeah. Interesting that does he believe that he is just in time to have a more or less comfortable game? I mean... Maybe he implies that after bishop d7, I'm going to go king f7, bishop c6, king e6, and I'm active enough. Is that his idea? 
Sorry, what move? I mean, after bishop d7, does he want mm -hmm. to give up the c6 pawn or will he defend with knight e5 or knight a5? I'm sorry, we are hoping to get this construction going, but I'm not sure if we can keep it up. Yeah, and bishop, yeah, bishop b6, b6 knight bishop d8, uh, for example. Uh, it's yeah. Now maybe knight e5, now that bishop no longer controls that square. Yeah, very unclear. Also, after bishop d7, perhaps it makes more sense than in the previous line to go bishop e5 because now after the trade your bishop's under attack but you probably move the bishop away after bishop e5 yeah i assume i'm gonna go bishop c5 right yeah in the meantime the chess 24 chat is questioning if it's really me in the chat it is that's why i'm distracted all the time because i'm talking to you people hmm Knight a5 played. Oof, this looks shaky for Ding. Because I'm not sure if you have this saying in the Hungarian or the Indian chess school. But in Germany, we say a knight on the rim is dim. But we never say a knight on the rim is Ding. Therefore, he can't be too happy about it. Bishop c3 played. Bishop c7, I guess. So black got his set up like you were mentioning, but still this G pawn can be very tricky, you know, with the with the two bishops. I know they just go for the exchange. Okay, this is just over now. Is it? Also, all the games are starting to look the same to me. Like this is the final position of Nakamura Aronian. Here mm. we have this. It's like a mirror image. Yeah, it seems like a dead draw, no? I don't know if... Was Yuyanji forced to go for this because of the clock situation? I mean, he decided very quickly on this bishop c bishop takes a5. Yeah, especially bishop a5. I'm somewhat surprised by... Maybe there was nothing better. But I felt like Ding was fighting for survival and then he was just given the draw instantly. Yeah. In the current position, just simply black trades off this, gets us king, king f6, king g5, goes h5, trades off one pawn, and then gives this bishop for the a pawn, and it's the wrong square, right? He's yeah, but there is even no need for it. He it can might just... Not to. <laughs> yeah. So you're just going to stop the king from coming to... I just... Chill. You're just not giving any pawns. But your yeah. plan works as well. Like it's, yeah. It's just... I mean, basically, I just signal to my opponent it's time to shake hands. I... I don't need any. On well, the Zoom call, they're like, <laughs> I know we're muted, but come on. It's late for both of us. Let's move on to the next game. <clears throat> so, King G6 now? Yeah, the thing is, like, even if White goes A5 at some point, you can actually take Bishop. But that might get a little tricky, no? This here yeah, should be pretty drawn as well. Yeah, but I mean, why on earth would you ever give your h6 pawn? Just put the bishop on g5 and bring the king to a7 and chill. And chill. I love it. Netflix Peter doesn't want any drama. Yeah. I feel like there were enough dramas in this game already. No need for some escalate, further escalations. Well, did I talk over Tanya's Netflix and chill reference? <laughs> King g6, and you just keep the bishop here and the king here, yeah? Yeah, I mean, what can happen to me? Yeah, and Ding mm -hmm. is going with his king to a7. Yeah. Solid play by Ding. I like that g5 idea. He took his chances, mm -hmm. went for this g5, knight h3 position, and then... Although the the moment when it went rook f7, it looked like it could be a little shaky for black, but handled very well in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be very interesting to ask Ding after the match that what he thinks now 
about this G5. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe at that point when he played G5, he liked it because it looked so promising. But I think that was the moment in the game when he regretted it. Yeah, Rook G4, King H1. It was actually a very, very instructive game. Yeah, really like the way. We it. Yeah, very Definitely interesting. Definitely out of ten and not a three out of ten. My excitement level level never rose above. 4.6 out of 10 in this whole game. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. already the super excitement, yeah? You could argue it's very hard for me to get above 50%. Okay, so the game is drawn. Hmm. What do we have? The, the game between Hikaru and Levon is about to start soon, yeah? Yes, and Levon in a must-win situation to tie the match and take it to Armageddon. Otherwise, his road to semifinals comes to an end and Hikaru qualifies. Yeah, and at this moment, I think Levon is completely for the Armageddon. He says that, please give me this Armageddon. So I, he, will, he will try everything what he can to, to, to try to force the Armageddon. And if he would get there, I would say that anything is possible. I believe it's much more difficult to reach Nado Armageddon than eventually maybe to make that big surprise and win that against Hikaru one time. Oof, that's a dark situation for Levon Aronian. If Armageddon is your best case scenario. But yeah, that's the spot he's in. Levon Aronian needs to win with the white pieces or he goes home. Yeah, and the big or question, he stays what should home, he, I should say. Yeah, what should he do? Because going again for this Queen's Gambit, I think, is not an option anymore. I mean, this previous game with White was just uh, way too harmless. It's not the way you want to try to, to hit your opponent in a must-win situation. So all the more interesting how Levon will deal with that game. Yeah, he played the English in their last Armageddon and got a decent position in this 1c4 where Hikaru also plays a very set line usually. So it could be something that he's interested in. Because if you play this against Hikaru, you are pretty much getting this. CD knight d5, bishop g2, knight b6 line, where yeah, could be Levon has that in his back pocket. I'm curious to see. But Trot has a saying Nakamura is 90% chance to advance, in his opinion. Yeah, that sounds about right, no? Because first of all, Levon would have to win the next game with White, then he would have to win the Armageddon, and that would also just mean that he gets a, another match. So it would not mean that he advances. So yeah, I think 90%. I mean, winning with White the next game and then winning the Armageddon is exactly what Hikaru did in their first mini-match. So don't write him up just yet, but yes, of course, Hikaru does have a huge chance of going through. But we've seen that narrative happen before, and it's going to be interesting to see what Levon does in the opening that might give him a chance. And this is also a good time while we wait for the rounds to kick off for you guys to head to chess24.com slash quiz and enter our second day of our four-part quiz, where we ask super difficult questions that nobody can answer because the prize is mega. It is this chessboard worth 1,000 euros designed by Anatoly Karpov. And these are the three questions for the day. And of course, I have no idea about any of it. What were the questions again? Which world champion? Oh, no, those are the last questions. I'm, I'm still thinking about the movie question in the back of my head. I even tried to secretly Google if Spassky was in a movie, but I did not make any progress. So I don't know it. There you have it. These are the three questions for today. Which world chess champion was the first to have a cameo appearance in a feature film? Hmm. In which world championship match was an electronic chess clock used for the first time? I think that's the most Googleable question out of the three. Also, and we could make a three. guess. No, Peter, do you remember when electronic clocks started taking over the scene? I would guess like mid 90s somewhere, no? Uh. Yeah, but uh, I mean, when exactly it's it's very hard to define. So let's. Was that maybe Karpov versus Kamsky in '96? 
Do you know I would say for sure, but I was thinking earlier, like Kasparov, Karpov, Lyon, New York, nine. 19... I just, I just got, I just got a WhatsApp from Vidit asking me that you know Netflix and chill doesn't mean watch movie and chilling, right? Yeah, and what does Netflix and chill mean? I'm not sure if this is a genuine question or not. I've made that mistake before because for a long time I thought Netflix and chill is how I spent my evenings. Then I was told it's the opposite of how I spent my evenings because I'm just watching Netflix while other people are Netflix and chilling. So yeah, Vidit, don't, <laughs> don't take us out of this family-friendly program. How dare you? Mm. I know Peter Leko is not a Netflix man. That's an HBO, HBO household right there. So we never have any <laughs> shows to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have been watching a uh, lot of, lot of movies, uh, series with, with my wife. And we have Liftoff. We have one E4 played by Levon Aronian. And as expected, it's the Berlin. This line that we've seen in the game so versus Carlson the other day with short castles seems to be becoming a thing again. And Nakamura plays bishop to d6 instead of Carlson's choice, which was, I can't even remember, 27? Probably 27. Yeah, and bishop g d6 met by bishop g5, h6, bishop h4. A very principled and very aggressive approach from Levon. h6, bishop h4. Interesting stuff. Bishop g5 also stopping. It's knight d7, regrouping d4 is looming. I don't know theory here. What do you do? I would guess queen e7, maybe keep your options open now. Yeah, there are all kinds of uh, all kinds of moves, but you already mentioned it absolutely right that after castles, bishop d6 is a very rare move. I think I looked at this with the pawn on a6 and I want a queen e7. Not sure how big a difference that makes. And queen e7 d4, how do you react? I think g5. Not sure. I also have bishop g4 maybe. <clears throat> yeah, you also have bishop g4, yeah. I mean, it's always annoying if your opponent has more options. So after queen e7, maybe I should not hurry with d4, right? Exactly. Let's see what Hikaru comes up with. Levon yeah, Aronian also is... very, very interesting, I think we should mention this, that Levon had this uh, very famous loss against Kramnik, this tragic loss with h3, queen e7 castles, yeah, with rook g8. I was just going to bring it up, yeah. But he's yeah. learned his lesson. And now he says that, okay, I'm going to go no for h3. this short castle idea, and I want to be the aggressive guy with bishop g5. And Hikaru Nakamura has played bishop to g4. Going for counter pin. So after h3, do you want to you just fall back or take on f3? Yes, bishop h5, bishop f3 yeah. looks sad, no? Yeah, bishop h5, of course, is, is principled. This could get funky. g5, maybe. Yeah, but Levon uh, immediately, instantly re replied with knight bd2. Knit. So he's not interested in all this hdg for provocation. Knight bd2. Probably he's also hinting to some knight c4, knight e3 maneuver. Yeah? That's the other typical way of dealing with the, the pin with bishop g4. Yeah. So many pins. Does black have a bishop g5? Because you haven't castled yet. I mean, black hasn't castled yet. Can black go g5? And go like g5, bishop g3, knight h5, knight f4. No, knight h5 I didn't like because then Peter's plan seemed in time. Although sometimes you can end up with this sort of idiot bishop here. No, I never understand these structures because this guy is sort of dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Everything else is great for white, but the bishop might never move. But I'm mean, in this new board that after queen f6, I had some bishop take c5. No, or could I take on e5 somewhere? g5 played and knight h5. Hmm. So knight. I, I like what black's doing. So what's How the line? Knight c4. After knight c4, yeah, because queen f6, I might be able to take on e5 or not. Let's see. Queen f6 and just bishop e5. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems to work. Oh, but that, yeah, that's because the HH rook hangs. Yeah. yeah. I mean, after you are still collecting some pawns, but it seems like. I mean, I wanted to show this bishop fc line. But then bishop, bishop f6. Yeah, bishop d1, bishop h8, and you can take on c2, and this will be falling, but I'm anyway doesn't doing fine. Enough. Yeah, it doesn't feel enough. Just take and repeat one. White wins. White wins. Queen e7, I like this much better, and he's probably going to go for... Well, we should talk about knight takes g3. He chose fg. Instructive, maybe. Because we're told to capture towards the center. No, yeah, no, but, but this the... is very dangerous. This is a different structure because of h5, h4 after long castle, no? Fg should be played here. Exactly. I mean, fg3 is the obvious choice. And also the knight is coming to e3. The other knight from fc moves probably to d2. White gets a uh, very nice pressure along the f file. I mean, I, I like Levon's position. He's also enjoying himself. No, he's doing like uh, strategically clever stuff. I think this is right up his alley. 27 c3. No, he's working on the bathtub. He wants to go b4 to take the c5 square. Then knight e3 becomes a topic. It's good stuff. At least Levon got a position to, to play with, yeah? Yep. All you can hope for in this situation, even if it's not winning objectively, there's tension, there's squares. It's not going to peter out and simplify. Long castle is played by Nakamura, and the bathtub, born to b4, is constructed. Yeah. Cool idea, no? Stops bishop c5 and prepares some attack. Sorry, there. No, I was just about to echo what you guys said, that this is exactly the kind of position you want in a must-win situation. Mm -hmm. Because obviously nobody's going to blunder in the first 10, 12 moves. You just want a game that's kind of, that can go either ways and uh, you take your chances like that. Yeah. B4, what should black do? Do you go h5, h4, or do you just uh, stabilize f6? Yeah, that's the point. It's not so easy for black to, to create counter chance. And this c3, b4 was very nice that it restricts black's bishop on d6. And uh, if the black bishop on d6 is stuck, black will never have uh, counter play against the weak d3 pawn because that's actually why it's only real weakness. And uh, now exactly this maneuver of knight e3 and then bringing the other knight to c4 also to start pushing a4. It looks very, very interesting. But Peter, you say it's not easy to imagine black getting counterplay here. Just explain that a little bit because like looking at this position, h5, h4 feels like like an obvious plan for black trying to make some threats. So why why is white not worried about that? Yeah, because after h5, I will always play knight e3. And when you move back the bishop to e6, after h4, I'm going to play g4. Against g4, I'm going to play knight h4. So I feel like you are not able to touch me on the king side. Nice. So h4 is met by g4, always. Yeah. But it was a very good point because uh, I was telling that, yeah, probably the white knight comes to e3, the other guy goes via d2 to c4, but that case probably with h5, g4, h4, you can create counterplay. So white has to watch out. Yeah, might not be better for white, but it's at least it's unbalanced. And chances here for Levon to make something up. We'll see. In the other game, Ding Liren versus Yu Yang Yi. The debate continues in a quiet 
ish. Queen's Gambit accepted. Knight BD2. Do you know this move, 7 Knight BD2, Jan? I'm sure it's somewhere in a file I have, but it's never been one of the main moves. No, like Bishop B3, B3, Bishop D3, A4, A3, Queen E2, Bishop E2, DC5. All these moves I know more about than Knight BD2. Knight C3 yeah, as well. Exactly. I mean, it's also very nice to see how Dingley then came prepared for this uh, today's match. Yeah. He already yeah. showed one idea with Bishop E2. Now he came up with Knight BD2. It's certainly not an idea he came up during the, this five, ten minutes break. He must have had this in mind already for today's match. For sure. Knight B2, Knight C6. And I like this because this is something I've been doing via a different move order. I've been playing a lot of Queen E2 here. And after A6, I would take. I was always hoping that they would play Knight C6 in these positions. But if they know what they're doing, usually they don't. And Ding waits for this knight to come to c6. And now he goes for d takes c5, bishop c5, and a3. And these positions are deceptively tricky because the knight on c6 is misplaced, standing in the way of the black bishop. And it does not allow black to simplify with, let's say, knight e4. So if the knight was on d7, this is equal. But here white has some pressure. And I like this for, for Ding in this situation. Zero risk, small pressure. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and also with knight b3, he has much faster access to the weak c5 square. Yeah. Yeah, the and knight on c6. c6 is always misplaced in the structure. Yeah, exactly. So it was very instructive, yeah, that he was basically with knight b2 <laughs> provoking knight c6. Yeah, I have a feeling maybe knight c6 is wrong. I don't know any theory here. b5, b6, cd4 all come to mind, but yeah, it's, it's a nice idea. Also, he goes bishop e2, yeah? My setup was always queen e2, bishop d3. But he's happy with just this. No, Ding with the white pieces is very impressive. Like for d4 players like myself, there's so much to learn, to learn from him. And he's bringing new ideas so often. It's, yeah, it's really a pleasure to watch. And as Tanya indicated the other day, it doesn't feel like it's a team of 15 seconds feeding him these ideas. It feels like it's Ding sitting in his room with his laptop creating them by himself. At least that's the impression I always have. Might yeah. be wrong. But you know, it's very interesting. My impression is that since the candidates that it uh, didn't go the way Ding uh, really hoped for, uh, his openings became much, much better ever since. He, I think this whole frustration that he experience during the candidates he put into a really big work and he has also changed his opening repertoire with black he started to play the berlin uh, i mean uh, i like what i'm seeing from ding how he reacted to this uh, catastrophic uh, candidates yeah it feels like he's added a million things no with white there's some one e4 with black there's the berlin the knight of the grunfeld and yeah the candidate still feels like more of a freak accident where i don't know Everything that happened to him with Corona and then being in quarantine in Russia for two weeks and so on. Of course, yeah, circumstances was, weren't ideal. Super unfortunate around the candidates because truly, I think Ding is one of those players who's just so mega strong in all three formats, classical, rapid and blitz. Um, I personally would think that currently he's probably Magnus's biggest challenge. And... I think it's really unfortunate that candidates, given circumstances that were out of his control, affected his play there. But um, definitely, he is uh, uh, would love to see a world championship match between him and Magnus. Yeah. No. Also, the semi-final match in this Magnus Cast invitation between Magnus and Ding was an incredibly tense match, where yeah, Magnus looked like he was getting kicked out. So Aronia Nakamura has heated up quite a bit here. Peter, yeah, what's this going F5, on? F5 is a stunning resource. H5, Hitaro. 93, Bishop C8, C4. This is the setup you indicated. Also C4 threatens C5. I was guessing he was hoping for C5, B5, and then you can access to this square. But F5 played. What is this? If C5, you take. Now there is this pin. 
and f4 is coming. But is there d4 here in that position? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Maybe. Still a mess. Such a mess. Just take on f5. I'm not sure what's going on at all. Me neither. Levon has chosen knight takes f5 directly. Here. Mm. Looks very, very promising if e4 is not good for black here. Yeah, e4 played. E4 played and rook e1 blitzed that. Pinning the pawn. Pin in chess jargon means that the pawn cannot leave his post to either side because then the rook would take the more valuable queen on e7. Rook e1, e3. Hey, Carl is on full alert mode. Jan, can we do like a body language reading by you? My body What's language mean? doctor skills have gone downhill during Corona. You don't see any people for three months. You lose, you lose that touch. The Jan. Looks focused. Live on. Okay, this is actually something that I've mastered during Corona because I can only see Levon's eyes and upper head you cannot see the nose or the mouth which is pretty much how you try to read body language in supermarket these days levon is nervous he wants to get out of this game as quickly as possible it's this typical supermarket covid 19 facial expression anxious like uh, let me get this done with but also intense focus to maintain your social distancing so Neither side is particularly nervous. They are just focused on the issue. And if eyes are the windows to the soul, can you tell us about Levon's soul right now? He has the soul <laughs> of someone who does want to play one more match in this event. I agree. The eyes do give that away. And E3 and Levon still thinking. What's the move? Looks good for white, no, Peter? Somehow, yeah, I mean, I do one not has the feeling that through. somehow it should be good. On the other hand, there are so many tactical possibilities and so many lines to calculate. Suddenly, Black's dark sweat bishop has awakened thanks to this uh, pawn advance e4, e3. Black has always this bishop e5, bishop d4 idea. So well, let's stop all this stuff. Go d4, no? Go d4, queen d3. What do you want to do? Yeah, uh -huh. that's, uh, that's the question, but you have to reckon with so g4, g4, knight h4, queen e4, for example, getting a lot of activity. Ugh. I don't like it when they get active. Mm. It's uh, very hard to judge. It's, it's a very tricky position, and Levon chose queen c1, so he wants to go after the e3 pawn immediately. Queen c1, subtle. But let's... This bishop out alive. No, I really don't like this bishop e5 business. So, so if, Rook goes H4. if black goes. Mm. Let's say here, a knight h4 and bishop e5, bishop d4 while hitting this guy. Mm. It's time to. Read facial expressions again. Levon, do you have this under control? Because Hikaru looks like he's ready for action. Hikaru always looks like he's ready to take action on the board. But I, this position right now after queen c1, there's this interesting line, rook h8, and I, I first thought c5 just wins the pawn. But the problem is after bishop e5, rook e3 runs into bishop d4 perhaps, no? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the main motive of Black's uh, setup. Yeah. I still want g4, but yeah, there's always. And you can always take the knight with g4 first. The problem with g4 is that White has this knight h4, knight g6 ideas. I don't know how good they are. And g4, g4 on the board. G4 plate, yeah. Mm. Mm. Expecting knight, knight h4. Expecting. 
and knight h4 threatening knight g6 and the pawn on e3. So this black or rookie here. I don't like it for white anymore. Can we still go Black to seems to have too much two. dynamics. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I mean, this e pawn is either very dangerous or it's just going to fall. Okay, Hikaru under some time pressure. Yeah, I mean, he only has six minutes versus Levon's 10, but this is a typical position that if in the next two, three moves clarifies and you have everything under control, then the clock is not an issue. Yeah, also six minutes, that's like five games for Hikaru usually. So. Yeah, I don't see a good move for what? D4 is a move I would like to play, but this queen e4 still bothers me. No, the bishop goes a reshuffle. I don't like it. Yeah, and since Levon is thinking, thinking, I'm wondering, did he maybe miss this rookies the queen f6, uh, knight moves bishop e5, and then uh, some fork or, I mean, some pin against the rooks? I, I don't see any other reason why he's not suddenly spending so much time. It's pretty obvious tactic for player of Levon Aronian's level, though, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, must be something wrong. Isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, it can simply be the case that you assume that after rook e3, you hit the pawn with tem. I mean, you take the pawn with tempo and you stop bishop e5, and then okay, something will happen, yeah. and uh, you maybe focus on rook h8 instead of g4 because Levon quite quickly played queen c1, so it was not like he spent so much time on that. No, and he kind of found a way to spice it up. Yeah, this strategically dangerous looking position. Yeah, the move king b8. King b8 was a very brilliant move. I mean, because he prepared bishop c8 back and actually he had to force already this f5 idea back then. Yeah. A3, you know, the one thing I've noticed about Hikaru is... He... Sorry, Jan, go on. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying the one thing I've noticed about Hikaru is he's still good at finding these quiet moves, which the ideas of which just become apparent and how strong they are later on. And I remember that move he played with Chris Chuk where he went 8-3 and in the round robin stage just and he doesn't take very long to come up with these quiet moves so he i think this is a very big strength of his yeah. don't disagree i would say though that king b8 even if you don't see a single idea associated with it it's pretty natural no it is yeah it's very natural but on the other hand you can argue that it felt like time is on the white side and black is the one who has to deal with, with this right. uh, situation as quickly as possible. So you might be tempted to look for some crazy ideas, but Hikaru understood that, no, no, in order to make this f5 counterplay, which I need, I first have to get king b8 and bishop c8 back. And only once I get that set up, I can think about this f5. That's why I felt it's uh, really high class. Absolutely agree. And also, I think, um, I think Peter, you're right that now that Levon's thinking, it is very possible that he missed this idea that rookie three just doesn't work right now because of queen f6. Yeah, it's not because of miscalculation. It's, I believe that Levon was simply not calculating it. He just assumed that g4 is not a move, rook g8 should be played, and then he had his idea, yeah, maybe. But now you can tell from his body language that something's wrong. Mm. Hmm. And by something's wrong, if this game doesn't go according to plan, everything's wrong because that would it's mean Hikaru goes through the semis and it's the end of the road for Levon. Would bring us one step closer to a big, big semi final between where champion Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. We're not I there think yet, with, these, with these players, yeah. Jan, any semi final is a big semi final. Yeah, I mean, zero disrespect to the other one, but I would still argue that whoever makes the other semi-final, it's not quite as big as Carlson Nakamura. Yeah, that is always... I hope Daniel Dubov is not watching. Daniel, if you're watching, I take it all back. 
No, but Dubov's in the other bracket anyway. That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> I thought we we're comparing Carlson Nakamura to the okay. on the other bracket. Right. right. And Aronia has played Knight H4 after some contemplating. Okay, G8, on to C5, Bishop E5, Queen takes E3. Is this what? an exchange sacrifice? Looks like it. So Bishop D4, Queen D4. Yeah, but that would look be quite interesting. But look at this, Hikaru immediately, like he anticipated this and went Queen D7. He doesn't want to, to let Levon have that and what is Levon doing now after Queen D7? Resigns, yeah. <laughs> Looks like oh resigns. He's losing a whole rook. Yeah. The threat is both... Ah, no, he has Queen C1. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was going to say the threat is both Bishop D4 and Bishop A1, but he does have Queen C1. Yeah, but this yeah. looks really bad as well. And yeah, Levon's exactly. And, and also the problem is that this King on H1 is uh, completely stuck in this structure, yeah, at the end. He might have some concrete issues on the back rank. Once they exchange everything, yeah, this king just resigns here with this knight out of play, yeah. and just take on a one and queen d3, and it's over. Safe in Wow, so... queen takes g3, and yeah, he did resign. And Hikaru Nakamura is the first semi finalist. Congrats to Hikaru, defeats Levon Aronia 2 0 in that matchup, yeah. Was got a bit, yeah, lucky or strong, but had a scare in their first match. But today he was just dominant, starting with game one, and moves on to the semifinals. Hikaru Nakamura, where he will face the winner of the Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley so much. All right, let's see what's going on in the other one between Ding Liren and Yu Yang Yi. I have a feeling. This match is going into day three. But before is... that, Jan, we do have a guest. We have Hikaru with us at first. Oh, he's here already. Wow. Hmm. Or, um, hi, Hikaru. Congratulations on that on uh, that win. Um, definitely. Yeah. Definitely things went smoother than the first match. Today, you were in control from the start. Yeah, I mean, I, I think generally speaking, the first game, if it's decisive, tends to um, set the tone for the whole match um, for the most part. And and yeah, I, I, I didn't really feel like I was in much danger. Maybe in the last game for a move or two, it felt a little bit uncomfortable. I'm, I'm not sure what was going on, but, but overall, it was very, very smooth, I felt. In that first game, as Marshall boys, we were claiming that Black should be more or less okay, and then it went downhill very, yeah, very I'm, quickly somehow. I mean, I think, of course, Black should be fine. I have a feeling that somehow when Levon let me play the C4 move without exchanging on B5, I felt like this is where it started to go wrong. I thought maybe instead of A6, I'm not sure, but I, I was kind of wondering if you could play like Knight B6 maybe. It's obviously a very strange move to play because you feel like you, you want to be solid with A6. But I kind of thought maybe Knight B6 was a simpler way because after A6, C4, all the exchanges... Um, he doesn't get to exchange the A pawns. And then, I mean, I think it's still probably probably should be a draw, but it becomes quite tricky, I think, after C4. Yeah, we were looking at some tricks like takes and so, something like A5, but already black has to be coming. Yeah, I mean, I mean, but uh, yeah, even this, I'm sure, is probably fine. But the problem is when you play this, you're trying to be very solid. Like to, to like take on C4 and go A5 when you've already played A6, it's like it's kind of hard to shift... I mean to shift from from one 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 zone to another one kind of whereas, right. but but I did feel night after after I got queen e four. I mean I think it's still probably holdable, but it's very very dangerous. Very little time on the clock. Um, and and then yeah, Levon just just allowed this bishop c two move. And he missed I, bishop c two. It felt like it. Like... Yeah, I mean it's not an obvious move to see. And I think after bishop c two, it's probably I think it's probably still a draw with knight g five maybe. I thought knight g5 maybe gives him a chance to, to hold this. Because um, if, I, if I trade the queens and take on a4, he has c5 at least. And um, if I take on c5, he goes knight e6. And I mean, even that is probably quite bad, but maybe there's some, some chances to hold this after c6. Um, because in the game, I mean, unfortunately, after queen g5, c5, it, just the whole thing collapsed instantly, basically. All right. 
Then yeah, not much going on in game. Well, I mean, game two. two was I mean, game two was was very interesting. I mean, I think if the match situation is different, I would have played on for sure. Um, in the Queens Gambit Sorry, Climb yeah, game. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think in in like a, in just a normal game where I'm not up one one point, I for sure would have played on. But the fact that I was up by having won the first game, I was already ahead in the match. It just felt like it was a little bit unnecessary at the end to play on. Kind of. Um, I mean, I think it's probably better for Black, but it just felt like I mean, wh why do you want to take the risk when I already feel that mathematically I should be the favorite. Um, I mean, if I'm leading the match, the less games are better. But also, I felt that even if I lose the last game somehow and get to Armageddon, I still should be a favorite since I get to choose the color. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I didn't play on. Game three was was very dry. And I mean, game four was the, the other critical game, I think. Do you ever get tired of this Knight BD7 C5 position? You must have had it like 30 times over the last two weeks, no, in these games? Well, I mean, I, I think the reality is that everyone has to show preparation with white. So if everybody's going to burn their preparation in online games, um, then then there's going to be nothing left by the time over the board chess returns. So uh, I think if anything, it's on it's on my opponents to, to prove it. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, of, of course, I think at some point it gets a little bit tiring playing the same thing. But I felt for the most part in the recent matches, I've gotten good positions. The first first couple of days in um, in the Magnus invite, I got some really, really, really bad positions. But since then, I think for the most part, I've gotten pretty stable positions. And as I said, everyone has to waste their preparation. So I, I, I don't care. It's I mean, they're, they're going to have less things to show when over chess returns. We shall see. Then... This third game was was what it was the same line like the first game, but he had a micro improvement. Maybe it's through K8. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what he did was relatively okay. I mean, it's the same thing. I just play with two bishops and kind of just keep the game going. Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't have traded. I should have gone bishop e2. But again, like when you look at the match situation and you're ahead by one point, it's one of those things where like, do do you really want to like take some risk and like allow some like. I don't know, like queen e6 and, and, and knight e4 and f5 or something like this. Like, what, what's really the point? Um, so, so I just decided to trade and then, I mean, just very, very flat. So that meant Levon had to win this next game with white and then the Armageddon here. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think really Levon got it. a good position. It felt like he should be better, but but actually, this game in a way it kind of reminded me of. Um, I know it's it's different, like the, the pieces, but it reminded me a lot of Magnus's game against Wesley yesterday, the second game in the Berlin, where like it, it feels like White should be much better. I know in Wesley's White definitely is better. I haven't actually looked at this one, but it felt like for me one or two moves, it was it was probably better for Levon, and then just very quickly it turned into nothing. Um, I thought everything he did was fine um, up until C four, I think. Like I had a feeling after Bishop C8, there there should be something a little bit slower here. Maybe just like Queen E2. Because if I ever go G4, you go Knight H4. If I go H4, you go G4, so you always can lock the King side. Um. And yeah, I mean, I I felt that I was actually a little bit concerned about this. Whereas when Levon like didn't do this, I I mean the problem with what Levon did is that maybe it's still good for White. But he already had five more minutes on the clock. So by playing C4, he forced me to just play F5. And then then all my moves, like they become almost only moves. So I don't really have to think. And if it's bad, it's bad. But if it's not bad, then then I'm completely fine. Um, so I, I thought what I did was was pretty good. E3, rookie one, I think only move and E3. And this is probably the last critical point. I think Queen C1 was definitely wrong, but Levon thought for maybe six minutes before playing it. So um, I, I mean, maybe there, maybe there was something better, but I think it's very, it's very, uh, very hard. It's very hard to find a move because even though I'm down a pawn, I get this bishop to e5, and and it's just a weird, weird kind of position. So, I mean, I, maybe there's something better than queen. Yeah, we tried one, to make d4 work, but we didn't check. Peter said, "What did we say?" Yeah, well, I mean, queen e4. Or four? <laughs> ah, this one. I was also thinking about queen. No, no, what was I thinking here? I was also thinking I could just play rookie eight, honestly, like rookie g eight, with g four. Yeah? yeah, 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 with g four, right. and like even queen d three, queen g five. Hang on, c five is not what I was going. I thought I had bishop e five here. Ah, again. okay, okay. Knight g six. I don't. I uh, know. Maybe not. No. Okay, go back then. Instead of rookie eight. Yeah. So okay, queen e four. Yeah, queen e four instead of rookie eight. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I don't know. Because the problem is, I mean, White's pawn's on the king's side. Like, he's up a pawn, but it's like he needs the knight somehow to, to jump back into the game because otherwise all these end games are going to be, I think, quite, quite 
reasonable for black, if not actually better, possibly. So I don't know. I mean, Levon thought for a long time, and he didn't find anything better than Queen C1. So I think, I mean, it shows that that it's quite hard to find uh, to find the precise moves. And I, I'm not even sure, actually, after E3, that black's not already completely fine. Um, and then, yeah, I played played uh, played played G4. I uh, had the feeling he missed take... something around here. Yeah, he was shaking his head. I don't know, maybe. Uh, I, I wasn't actually looking at the camera. I was, I was just thinking about the moves. Yeah, I mean, a, again, the problem is this, these pawns on the king side. These the, the two pawns, basically. I mean, white has two more pawns, these four pawns. But, it, I mean, with the double G pawns, it's just they, the pawns really don't actually matter that much because you can't really attack the pawns on the light squares. So it's just structurally very weird. But I think, I mean, I think it's fine for black objectively already. So, I mean... Last couple of moves, Levon obviously just um, he just blundered Queen Queen D seven, but but even even so, I think it's it was already really really hard for him. So yeah, congratulations! You're moving on to the semifinals. It looks likely that you will face Magnus yet again. <laughs> <clears throat> What's the plan there? Prepare or go in fresh? Do you can you even prepare for these rapid games with four? Four games a day. How do you? Do I mean, I mean, I mean. I guess what I would say is, first of all, I'm very lucky because I think I get what three three days off. I think, okay. um, so I, I don't have to play for three days. So I definitely have time to prepare. Um, I mean, I, I think it really depends on the match situation. I think you come in with a couple of ideas based on what the what how the match is going, um, and then you sort of pick pick one. Like today, I had a couple of different ideas for Levon um, with, with both colors actually. And it's like, if, if I'm ahead, I'll stick to the regular stuff. If I'm behind, obviously, I have to try something different. So um, I think you just come up with two to three ideas, and, and that's that. And I mean, you hope that you don't have to have to take risks. Uh, you hope that it's pretty smooth and your ideas with white work. But mainly, just a, just a couple of basic ideas and go from there. I can see Peter has two to three questions. Peter. <laughs> well, congratulations, Hikaru. It was really very nice the way you finished the match. And uh, please tell me something about the format as a player. How do you like it? Uh, because I was speculating before that, uh, how do you, the players feel on the second day? You felt like the need to change something or was it clear that you will just stick to your strategy and see first who will blink first? I mean, maybe Levon will come up with something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think again, like everything, it depends what the situation is. If I'd lost on, if I'd lost two days ago in the first match, I think it would have been, I would have been a lot more tense for sure. Um, and, and I think certainly the strategy might have been different, but the fact that I won and I, I actually thought I played quite quite poorly on the on the first day um, really made me confident just sticking to the strategy. I, I think when you play well and you lose, um, then then there's more you have more sort of you can reflect more on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. But I think when you when you play when when you play, I mean, I really felt that I played badly on the first day, and you still find a way to win the match. I think certainly um, you, you you feel much much more confident sticking to what you do because you, you, you assume that you, you can't, you can't keep playing badly. Or your opponent's not just going to blow you off the board. Um, so, so yeah, I think it depends on the first day, but for me, I, I really don't mind the format. I, I, I kind of wish instead of Armageddon, there were maybe two blitz games or something before that, but, but otherwise uh, it's completely fine. I think certainly having it not just be one knockout match, having it be like three possible matches certainly is going to favor the player who plays uh, the higher quality moves overall. And, I mean, I think I think I'm capable of playing at a very high quality for the most part. So, so yeah, I I, I, I like it. Yeah, in game four, if we could, Jan, go back to that moment when Hikaru played this king b8 because I was praising this idea a lot. This king b8, bishop c8, and preparing f5. I thought that this really shows that how much you have been in control of all the situation because it felt like your position is very dangerous, and uh, you might have the feeling that you need some desperate measures and then you find first these very two quiet moves and then you got f5 how did you feel about this i mean first of all peter you uh you 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 think you think way too highly of me um i just played king b8 cuz it looked like a natural move the, the idea was not to go bishop c8 and f5 i just i just i just saw i saw there was a quiet move that made some sense cuz i didn't really see any other move um but but actually you know the thing is i wanted instead of king b8 i actually wanted to play f5 right away but when I was looking at these f5 ideas with like knight e3, um, fe4, knight takes g4, ef3, queen f3, there were always problems with like knight f6 and a queen f5 or queen g4 coming. So actually, that was more the reasoning behind king b8. Um, 
I mean, I wish I, I wish I thought thought as deeply as you do, honestly. Because I mean, in a classical game, I probably would think of it, but in the rapid game, it's just a quiet move that I played because I didn't see a better move, honestly, and I wanted to go for f5. But but yeah, if I had more time, I would have played. I, I probably would have seen the idea, but certainly, um, yeah, it's. I, I I wish I had seen. It. I wish I could. I wish I could pretend to be that much of a genius, but I, I did not actually think that deeply at all. Yeah, but this is exactly what I meant, that your intuition is working perfectly, yeah? because in a rapid game, of course, you cannot foresee everything. And right, by no true. means, at no means I had foreseen it. I was just saying, once I have seen you play King B8, Bishop C8, F5, that it all made sense and it looked so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely true. I, I, I think that's, it's very similar to when you look at your own games with computers, actually. Very often when you see some idea, like you never would think of it, but then when you look at it with the, you know, Sockfish or Leela, Basically, it's like, oh, that's so obvious. Like, it, it, it makes all the sense in the world. And, um, and so, yeah, I think you're certainly right from the intuition standpoint that, that at least intuitively, I was able to sort of feel what, what, the, what the right ideas were. And I think it was very important because I used a lot of time as well. Like, I think already here, I was down maybe three or four minutes on the clock. I think I had about six and a half, seven minutes maybe. And so it was very, very important to, um, to find the right moves. And luckily, yeah, my intuition, I think, served me well today. So much King B8 talk. No disrespect to the move, it's a fine move, but I was arguing, come on, it's just a natural move. Peter's been praising it for like 10 minutes straight. How brilliant it is. <laughs> it was a great move. We got to have to ask you this now. We've got some uh, body language uh, reading going on during your game by our in-house expert, Yan. But when you guys are playing and your opponent goes into a bit of a think tank, or you're better, do you guys check on each other's... Um, uh, camera on the zoom call or just completely focused during the game yeah so i mean i think this is a very interesting thing um i suspect i'm one of the few people who actually does look at look at the look at the webcam when, when they are thinking i think most people don't do that um but i i've had some experience i played a tournament with the pro chess league where you could see the people on zoom um so I, i've had quite a bit of experience with it and i am generally looking but every event is different and i think um you know, for example, there was the FIDE Nations Cup. And in that one, you actually could not see your opponent's webcam. And so to me, I felt that was a, a big mistake because I think you ha you should be able to see your opponent face to face. There's no reason that you shouldn't. Um, so I definitely do look at my opponent's face. Um, for the most part, I also try not to be too expressive um, unless, unless it's already very clear what's going on because I do know that like Levon certainly could be looking at me. But I, I'm, I have a feeling that... Maybe, maybe I feel like Magnus probably does, and I know I do it, but I, I suspect most other people are not actually looking super closely um, at the body language of their opponents. Yeah, because over the board, you just have to look up, but here it's, uh, it's slightly harder to get an idea of what your opponent's uh, thinking by just looking at them. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, yeah, over the board, you can sense it more, but I still think that... Um, that people people do react in a different way because for example uh, you know if magnus is playing over the board let's say he makes a blunder and loses a game of course he's going to be very very unhappy but i think like and this applies to everyone not just magnus but i'm using this as an example but you've seen magnus when he's lost some games like he throws his hands up in the air or he, he has a big reaction i've had a couple of them as well and i know that over the board we'd be really unhappy but the reaction wouldn't come out until we're away from the board because everyone's watching but online you kind of forget sometimes about this and so it's actually in some ways much easier to have have tells and and sort of giveaways in, in, in a way that you want um over the board absolutely well uh, congratulations on uh, yes yeah go on i have one last question um and maybe he Caro knows because we have this quiz every day and today's question is which former, no, which classical chess world champion was the first to appear in a movie as a cameo? And I thought maybe you, with your recent Billions appearance, you did some research about chess players. No, Very I definitely didn't. Um, I mean, I, I didn't. I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I feel like it's, I'm going to take a guess that it's, who would it be? Okay. So it's not, I, I doubt it's Stein. It's, it's, it's too far back. Um, film. I don't even know exactly when the first movies were. If I had to take a guess, I'm going to say it was... I don't know, but just taking a guess, I'm going to say it was probably... Ali Akin, that's my guess. It's probably wrong, but that's my guess. Thanks a lot. There you go, quizzers. We still don't know either. Thank you so ah, much, Ricardo. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, you got Great. the answer? No, no, I didn't get the answer. I thought I thought that you guys had the answer. I'm going to tell you, but it's actually the quiz hasn't happened. No, yet, no, so we, we actually don't know. No, no, it's a question to everybody, but we don't know the right answer. So. Okay, great. I'll I'll take a look then and see see. I'm sure I'm wrong, but we'll see. 
All right. Thanks, Hikaru. Looking forward to your semifinals. Sure, no yeah. problem. See you guys in a few days. Congratulations, Hikaru. Okay, yeah, bye. Congrats. So we missed some action in the Ding versus Yu Yang He match. Not that much action, though, because the third game was drawn and they will move on to game number four where Yu Yang has the white pieces and will be in a must win situation because he's down 2 1. Is that correct? Yeah, that should be correct. Um, yeah, Let's take a look. Let's have a look what we missed here. Actually, yeah, you we only very pretty, briefly pretty saw forced at here. some yeah. point, yeah. Just a second, Jan. Can you go back two moves back? Uh, because I would love to give some praise for knight a5 because this was very important that black was just in time to stop knight b3. And uh, because of this, white was not able to stabilize anymore and had to go for this uh, four segments that happened in the game. Yeah, looks doish, but those d2 pawns are very tricky. Yeah, if the white king and the bishop are controlling it, then it's still a bit risky for black and. Black has to show precision. How did Black manage to neutralize it? Went after this guy and e4. It feels like even if we lose a pawn, we'll probably survive. Huh? Yeah. Ah, but that was the point behind rook d8 was very important because white was not able to come closer with the king because of bishop c4 check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the key defensive idea. And luring the rook back to a4, and then black could go after the c5 pawn. Also, I guess Ding did not feel like he had to take too many chances. He's leading the match, and it's similar to what Hikaru said. Yeah, okay, I'm in the lead, so let him let him take the risks, no? Yeah, absolutely. So we will have the beginning of that match, of that final game. In a couple minutes, Ding Liren can prolong that match, make it a third mini-match between the two, should he not lose that next game. Should he lose? They will go to Armageddon. We will go on one more short break. That gives you guys the time to check out goodoldchess24.com. Maybe if you want to support the event and challenge the world champion, other chess superstars to a Banta Blitz match, go get a premium subscription. You can get two months for the price of one. Currently, I'm sure the bonus code will be on the screen in a minute. We'll be back with you when the next game begins. Thanks for watching. There you go. Code double. Chess is simple. You just make the right moves. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Move Trainer empowers you to go from the opening to the end game with confidence. It's a seamless, effective, and fun way to study chess. Choose from one of the largest online chess libraries in the world with hundreds of titles ranging from classic books through to our exclusive Chessable courses, including over 100 free courses. Get expert insights from International Master John Bartholomew, Grandmaster Sam Shankland, International Master Christoph Silecki, Grandmaster Simon Williams, World Champion Magnus Carlsen, and hundreds of other instructors. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts at chessable.com. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery.
Now anyone can learn and improve their chess skills with the world champion, Magnus Carlsen. The Magnus Trainer app is packed with fun mini games and interactive training content. Playable anytime, anywhere. Get the Magnus Trainer, available in the App Store and Google Play. E5, it's E5, Patsers. A complete repertoire against one E4, based on one E5, now available to study with Chessable's unique Move Trainer technology. The backbone is the Marshal Gambit against the Spanish, with three Knight F6 against the Italian. Jan Gustafsson has revisited all these lines he has played for 20 years and worked on as a second for Peter Lecco and Magnus Carlsen, amongst others, with the help of the most powerful engines out there, Leela Zero and Stockfish 10. This has led to many new discoveries and a repertoire ready to master on chessable that can serve the student for a long chess career. Maybe E4 doesn't exist after all. E5, it's E5, Patsers. Let's not just look at openings move by move, but let's try to understand a little something and look at a few typical structures that can arise out of a bunch of main openings. And hopefully understanding these structures and the typical plans and the ideas will help you a little bit in your own practice. Laurent, what structures will we cover? So first of all, we will cover the one very famous structure, uh, Karlsbad structure, which can arise uh, from the Queen's Gambit mainly, but from other openings as well, like uh, the London system or the Karokan. Yes, uh, so, fond childhood memories of the Karl's part. Thank you. It's important for everyone to understand what's going on here. Yeah, exactly. Then we will have a look at uh, some uh, Rui Lopez, actually, which is a classical line, not the Marshall or the Berlin, but this classical position where White plays D4 and sometimes even uh, goes like the pawn on on d5 or uh, even even sometimes taking on c5 we'll see some nice game of uh, bobby fisher here and some nice cup of game after d5 here you will share your russian upbringing with us you have all the classical education in the real Lopez. some nice examples there hopefully then we move on to the french structure which i don't understand particularly well but this position has always intrigued me. Who's better and why? What are the plans? Why can white hope for an advantage? Is a space advantage such a big deal? And the French structure can, of course, arise mainly via the French after moves like knight c3, knight d2, or e5. But we also have a small detour into the Karakan, which is very similar, but not quite the same. I've always been intrigued by this because the bishop can go out here, bishop f5, and it's of course us is times for for black, but uh, it's not life is not that simple as we will see. And the last topic uh, will be the symmetrical positions, which kind of hides basically. Uh, from Welcome back, everybody. I had to interrupt the commercials there because I got so excited about this position that they have on the board. It's the two knights defense with bishop b5 check, c6, d takes c, b takes c, a crazy gambit line where queen f3 was played. And I am so excited because I just covered this in my chessable course and I gave a very funky idea here for black and I can't wait to see if Ding will play it. If he's seen my course, if he knows that idea, what he's gonna do. Peter, you are a big theoretician, but you said you're not a knight f6 guy, right? So I'm not sure how much you know about this. Exactly. So I'm all ears what you are telling about this position, but uh, judging by the fact that Ding is not answering immediately, it means that probably this move came as a surprise, which brings me to the point that if uh, he manages to win this game then uh, and win the match today, we should ask him whether he has studied your course or not. 
He hasn't. He's gone CB5, which is also a good move. I've studied this, and I think it's playable as well. Queen takes A8, Queen C7. But he has not gone for my idea, which is even cooler. <laughs> my idea is this. Um, and now, knight f6, g f6, queen a8, queen, queen d7, I think was, which is a very, very funky line. But Ding didn't do it. I'm very disappointed, Ding there. And also, he doesn't play queen c7, he goes bishop e7. Interesting. Yeah, but look at the bright side, Jan. If Ding doesn't make it through and actually it turns out against him, you can, um, you could suggest to him that he could look at your course next time. I had a feeling already during the candidates that he did not study my course, and I was a little heartbroken thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this line is very, very sharp as well. Black sacrifice in exchange and is trying to use that lead in development to create problems. Bishop e7, I do know that the computer does not favor this move. He thinks white is better. No, computers do like at big, big depth to go queen c7 here. Mm. Preparing knight c6, targeting c2. But yeah, h6 is a much funkier line, so I'm bitterly disappointed. Let's go back to commercials or whatever. <laughs> but okay, what is happening now after bishop e7? Yeah, white castles. So black has sacrificed the exchange. He has big lead in development. He has very nice light squared pieces i mean let's just imagine this knight from a5 getting to d4 it would be just brilliant for black so all kinds of possibilities yeah yeah the question is can white untangle or can black create something i guess bishop e7 the idea after castles must be to castle himself castles castles i don't know knight c3 i guess b4 knight e4 how does this go d can black go queen c7 with the idea to go bishop b7 and got knight d5 or queen f3? Probably I queen f3. I can't calculate. I don't know if I can take. Knight. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit strange to go queen c7 when the knight comes to c3 already, right? Or... Yeah. Okay, you anyway needed bishop e7 short castle as well, yeah, because the, the bishop was pinned. It's, it's very tricky. I don't know. I do know that I checked all this territory carefully for my standards, and I did not like this bishop e7 move for, for black. So either Ding is deeper or he's improvising. I have a feeling he's improvising because h6 feels strange as well. Provoke this knight e4. <clears throat> Dr. Ding, what's going on there? Queen yeah, f3, h6 like is such a pretty line. Yeah, it feels like he's uh, mixing up ideas. Yeah, this yeah. is typically the case when you're not entirely familiar. You know more or less what you are supposed to be doing, but in which order, how you, you are not sure. And over the board in a rapid game with so much at stake, it's not easy to to understand it. Yeah, h6 played, but yeah, it feels like this not on g5 was a problem for white anyway, which you want to move away, try to exchange it. So to give a tempo, 94, queen d7, now he's playing this idea. From <clears throat> that, I recommended this queen d7 and then castle bishop b7, but it's a much slower version. So, yeah, it seems like he's mixing five different plans, and normally you can't do that when you're in exchange and a pawn down. Yeah, I mean, white also has some ideas like d4, no? Because bishop b7 is sure. still not a threat. Maybe, Maybe you can just tempo. break up the center, no? What happens after d4? I don't know. I guess okay, castles. you have to go short castles, yeah. The speed by which he played queen d7 sort of made me believe that maybe he does know all this, but also I don't see it because we are a lot of material up. No, like if I take and now go back, do you have do you have a tech? Yeah, exactly, because only the knight on d4 can do me some harm, and I don't see yeah. it. It like happened so, even C3. Yeah. so quickly, yeah. No, it feels like Ding has mixed this up. Yeah, I really, really like this line. H6, knight e4, cb takes queen d7. I think it works pretty well, too. Hmm. Check it out. Well, now... 
It's a good choice by Yu Yang Yi because it's one of these all or nothing lines. Yeah, it's complete chaos. Even if black is fine objectively, you you can lose with white, but you can also win with white. So in a must win situation, I like his choice. Yeah, absolutely. And okay, he knows Ding probably also way too good. He knows that outplaying Ding is almost impossible. So this is his best chance. Yeah. So Ding is going for knight f6, gf6. So d4 not played. And he goes gf to, I don't know, maybe open the tree file. Yeah, the only trick is that whenever you go rook g8, you cannot play bishop b7. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need bishop d8. But you have some bishop d8 ID and then getting bishop to the diagonal. But is black going to go knight c6 next? Yeah. So does, should white just come back, fall back with the queen? But if you fall back with the queen, then bishop b7, rook g8 becomes a real idea. I'm also yeah. not sure if you're already threatening knight c6. If I go knight c3, no. It feels like I should still have time to free myself somehow. There are also some knight d5 ideas, but knight d5 runs into bishop d8. Maybe, yeah. But still, you cannot play bishop b7 because of knight f6 check. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's a big mess. Very sharp. Yeah, if we go back, it looks very close to, to my line, actually. It should be seven. Yeah, going back, I don't really like, yeah, because then I feel this knight takes f6, g f6 heavily favors black. Yeah, and we start with rook g8 even to threaten this. Yeah, this looks interesting. Yeah. I have a feeling, though, from the moves that Ding sort of knew this line, but he got the move order wrong. <laughs> Because he's playing the same moves, just in a, a different order. The CB should be 7. Queen T7. Okay, I don't know. And GF6. Mm. Yeah, but it's also a typical position that if you don't know the concrete evaluation or you don't know the concrete suggestion of the computer, then how are you going to play this in a rapid game, yeah? Oof. It's it's so difficult to orientate. Each move has very high price, so... Especially now, it's such a big decision for white. No d4, knight c3 or queen f3. Yeah. It looks like a kind of position that's hard to play with either colors in a rapid game. Maybe easier with black though. No, you want knight c6, castles, bishop b7. Hmm. And queen f3, rook g8. The problem is you might be lost with black. Yeah, really quick. So knight c3, knight c6, what's the line here? I knight like d4. this knight d5 move by Peter. And d4 here, does this work? Do you, do you castle? What's going on? Yeah, because you can castle maybe. I don't know. But bishop, bishop h6, h6 bishop and b7, yeah. Mm -hmm. I still have knight f6, still, f6 yeah. yeah. Oh, damn. That's, that's quite an incredible line. Yeah, but you can play rook e8, for example, and then I don't know if it, if it will work at all. I have some d, bishop b7, rook a d1 then, yeah? <laughs> Look at this, rook a d1 now. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, please evaluate this over the board with time ticking, yeah? It's just impossible. No, I like white. No, no, we've weathered the storm. We, we took enough pawns. Yeah, but on the other hand, this knight cc, knight d5 is very committal because if your queen gets trapped, yeah, then course. you look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's much easier said than done. It's no surprise Yu Yang Yi is taking his time here. Somehow d4 also feels like a natural move. So after knight c6, we have d5 maybe. Yeah, I mean, in, in this sense, also already before knight takes f6, d4 was my first intention. Yeah, this. I'm a little bit surprised that he bleeds out knight takes f6 and after gf6 he's thinking. Right. But after d4, does black want to take on c6? Uh, does black, black definitely doesn't want to take on d4 with the e pawn, right? That's too dangerous. So does he want to go knight c6 anyway? I would assume knight c6, yeah. And then after d5, knight d4 or what? Yeah, something like this. Tough spot for Yu Yang Yi, but he's one of the better calculators out there. Yeah, he and played, he's played queen, queen e4. e4. Okay. 
not a move we saw coming. But the same problem, like queen f3, no, rook g8, bishop b7. Rook g8, does he want to go queen f7? Seven. But even that, like rook g8, queen h7, rook g6, and not to queen h8, just go bishop f8, isn't... It no, but like queen h7 queen... is not possible because of some rook g2, no? Oh, yeah, maybe it's checkmate. Also, even if not, it would be a strange yeah. idea that in order to free our queen from a8, we put it on h7. <laughs> yeah, after rook g6, it just looks like lost for white. But rook g2, does that work, queen... Yeah, it looks checkmate. But it's not me. No, I've got queen g... Ah, yeah, 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 but actually a draw thing wins the match, so draw is like a win, no? Draw is fine, yeah, yeah, you can't allow it anyway, but it's also checkmate. Yeah. I think after queen e4, he wants some f3, queen e2, that's his uh, setup, I believe. Rook g8 played. Rook g8 played, but f3, queen e2 looks dangerous. I mean, but it looks... Queen e4 is kind of like an understandable human move, because like you pointed out, this whole thing of getting your queen trapped on a8 after knight c3, knight d5, just... You need so much time to calculate that because otherwise you're lost on the spot. Speaking of exactly. lost on the spot, F3, there's a check. Queen take. Ah, and still rook G2, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, pretty. Queen H3, Queen F1. But F3 played. Wow. Oh my God. Dr. Ding. Well, King H1 is maybe not saying... false. Maybe there's D4. <laughs> Yeah, but I was also not saying that this is good. I was just saying that queen e4 is basically connected with this f3 idea because yeah, after d4 you can probably even take queen d4, no? Mm -hmm. Or maybe not as strong takes and now we go away, no? <laughs> yeah, you're getting away. Yeah. But this feels shaky. Bishop d4, if king h1, I still have rook g2 and bishop e3. There must you be have f5. 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 Ah, but then queen d3, but bishop um, takes b2. I mean, what is this? It's uh, not good for white. Maybe only chance. And Yu Yang is shaking his head. He knows. I think he just missed this idea. Yeah, Yu Yang it is does not. does look like it's falling apart. Let me have a look at Mr. Yu. Yeah. Ding's not going to miss this one. I think he's not just double, triple checking, yeah, not to not to run into some unpleasant surprise. So bishop c5, king h1, rook g2 just looks like it's game over for white, no? I don't see a move. Queen h3 rook h2 is a threat. Rook h2, yeah. I mean, you'll have to go queen h4 or something, but this just looks like it should be lost. And bishop c5 bishop check played. played. Wow. Yu Yang Yi looks very unhappy. So this means if it looks like Ding is about to win, which would mean that we would have a third match in that case, a third mini match. To decide our second semi-finalist from this bracket. Yep. D4 played. You move bishop d4 blitz that. And now king g2, king h1 is again met by rook g2. So bishop e3 looks like the only move. So after bishop e3, how is black continuing? Is it f5? Or yeah, I mean basically everything because Bishop E is kind of uh, agreeing that you lost the match because f5 queen d3 bishop takes b2. I'm not only winning back the exchange, but I'm also changing queens and I'm better if not winning. Yes. So Bishop E is a very sad choice, but Bishop E is played because he doesn't want to get mated. <laughs> Yeah, expecting this to be a mini game and end very, very soon. Which would make things extremely exciting for us because that would make their mini mats go 1 1 and we would have a third match between Ding and Yu Yangi. What a comeback by Ding Liren. Yeah, absolutely. I also feel that it's uh, well deserved because there was no need uh, Ding losing that match, uh, that first match. And also today he has been playing very good chess. So it's very fair that he, if he equalizes, it's not over yet. 
So let let them decide it in the in a third match. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Peter. I think um, I think D Ding definitely deserves a third match after the way things went in the first one. Uh, Yu Yang Yi, of course, a very very deserving winner. Also, he played resourcefully and he played the Armageddon fast, just like you're supposed to. But Ding was it did look like Ding um, dominated to whatever degree, despite having four draws that whole match. And um, a very, very, very strong comeback by the world number three. I'm reading imminent loss for you saying, I hope Ding finds queen a3. How does it work? Queen a3, I thought about this, but rook f2, what's... Are you just go bishop b7 or what? Yeah, bishop b7 and bishop takes f3, that's it. Because you have to go queen d3. Queen h7 runs into rook g2, and queen oh, d3 yeah. runs into bishop f3. Rook g2 is very nice because you take in bishop e3 and bishop h f3. Yeah, I think it's bishop f3. Yeah, no, even the queen, yeah. Yeah, no, if you're clicking h1, bishop f3, yeah. Yeah, this is over. So is he really going to find queen h3? But I also feel f5 is such a human move to make here and also looks pretty strong. Yeah, but if this wins, Ding is a sharp tactician. <laughs> Why not end it? How does this go after queen d3? You just take on f3 or what, what's over? Yeah, I assume. Yeah, bishop f3 and. Looks over, no? And queen b5 is just one check or what? Yeah, queen b5, I'm not worried. Then I can even go knight c6. And no other check, yes. Yeah, and GC is always bad by rook G3, HG, queen H1 checkmate. Very Looks great. pretty good, even though I'm reading it's impossible to miss queen H3. I don't know. I'm not sure you even consider queen H3, or maybe you think about queen H3, rook F2. I think it's very possible to miss that. Especially yeah. since you have other tempting options like F5, queen D3, take here. Yeah, exactly. And basically you win the match. But I mean, Dink has enough time to... To, to check all the options. It would be a different story if he would be done to one minute on his clock and he has to make an instant decision. If he sees Queen H3, also a question how much anger he has from yesterday, yeah? that losing the match in Armageddon, what kind of damage it done to him. Maybe he feels like if I get a chance, I want to checkmate my opponent. Yeah. No, and then even though FI might feel like a human move, the thing is that uh, yeah, these guys are a little above that. I think you're absolutely right that Ding does have time and he probably, even if you look at him right now, he, he can smell that there's something and he is calculating um, something beyond F5 because if he sees F5 and is convinced by it, he would have played it by now. But he's definitely looking at Queen H3. It's also the kind of thing that once you see Queen H3 as an engine line, you know, it might feel like it's easy to spot. But over the board, it's really credible if he does play queen h3 as well um it's like one of those things that once you spot it or once you see an engine suggesting it it feels obvious but when on the board nobody's telling you that it's available it's not so obvious you it's a little harder yeah absolutely i mean uh, very good point <clears throat> but here of course yeah one feels that the whole idea for black yeah after g takes f6 and going rook g8 was about uh, hitting your opponent on g2. In this sense, it's very logical. And queen h3 played. It's on the board. Amazing. And rook f2, bishop b7, expecting a resignation from white soon. And what? look at Yu Yanji's body language. I mean, we talked about body language. It's very difficult to see on the camera. But here we see that Yu Yanji is just shocked. And he understands very well that, yeah, it seems like that's it. You know, we also spoke about expressive players and I have to say the Chinese players in general actually just feel like they're so much in control of their emotions while playing and it's just, they're probably the hardest to judge when it comes to body language and face expressions. Just all of them, even the women, even the women players in the, in the Chinese team, like they just uh, are able to be so much more in control of their Nerves and queen h7 on the board, and now this rook g2 beautiful line. Yeah, Done. and it's happening. 
on king h1, bishop f3 just over. Or is it bishop f bishop f3? You do have queen g8 and knight c3 though, right? Is there some and then bishop f4 or what? Yeah, or bishop g5 or something. Yeah. Ah, yeah, bishop f4. Yeah, bishop f4. That's that's it. And queen h2 checkmate. Three. Queen g2. Queen g8 check. King e7. Let's play queen f3. Queen g8. King e7. Knight c3. Knight c3 mm. now. Yeah. No mate yet. So why not just bishop f3? Like game over, no. Yeah, he might have missed it. Yeah, I mean, let's just go back there. If Bishop F3 was it made? It looked just made, Peter, after Bishop F3, Bishop F4. Yeah, it looked. Or even Bishop G5, but then you had Rook G1 in that position. Isn't or, it still okay, kind you of still had some yeah. King G1. Maybe you had some King G1. So how was the line here? Queen J check, King E7, Knight D2. Yeah, knight. Ah, Knight D2, you go. But okay, Knight D2, I can just take on D2. So you have to go Knight C3. Ah, you, okay, okay. No, you yeah, you have to go knight c3 and then bishop f4 and king g1 here. Yeah, it's the only way to avoid the mate. Yeah. It's all pretty sad. And yeah. the game queen f3 was played uh, knight c3, but it still looks to me. It looks sad, but it's not over right now. Is in control. Oh, Let's say I go. I don't know what to do. Knight c4. Yeah. Before. Yeah, it's completely winning actually. I mean, yeah. white where, is not even is material going? up for all this. Yeah. <laughs> like to have a square. No. Because my two bishops, I can exchange for your two rooks whenever I please. Yeah, bishop g5 played. I even wonder if some very primitive h5, h4, h3 is possible. I don't know. You just cannot do anything. Also, he wins the match with a draw, right? So we can even play for perpetuals, like queen f2, bishop g2, queen f2. Queen f2 on the board. It's finishing the match. Mm, nice. Very oh, pragmatic. Yeah. I guess he can still win if he wants to as well, because white really can't do anything. There's no need. Yeah. But I do feel that if Yuyanji is not getting mated, he gets away with this game, he will feel very much relieved. Because he was running the danger of ending up losing in a miniature style. Not sure if he cares. <clears throat> you know the German saying, Ein gutes Pferd springt nie höher als es muss. Meaning, <laughs> <laughs> a good horse never jumps higher than it has to. And here, draw is perfectly good. Yeah, I I agree result-wise, but you know, it it always uh, has a very big effect. I think all the chess players uh, want to avoid losing in a miniature style because then you know that this will be published everywhere. It will get into all books. You will get all the attention. Your name will be familiar with with something like uh, connected with some disaster. You want Peter, to it's 2020. That. There are no more books. He's, the game's going to be on, on Twitch. <laughs> <clears throat> Even worse, no? <laughs> that's it it's done thing going on to two and a half and finishing the match as required winning on demand this second mini match between Ding Liren and Yu Yang Yi so that equals their score to one each which means we're going to have another mini match uh, day after tomorrow between these players to decide our second semi-finalist what a brilliant day of chess we've had and Kudos to Ding Liren to come back from um, from what happened in, in their first match and in style, to do it in style. Yeah, just a controlled performance, crushing the first game, never in any trouble afterwards, it felt like. Ding Liren back in this match. And to me, it feels like he is the favorite going into day three, but we shall see. As they say in the business, Ding is back in big business. Not sure that's how they say it in the business. No. Uh, <laughs> all right. What else is there to say in the business? First of all, thank you everybody for watching. It's been a fun day. Thank you so much, Tanya and Peter, for covering all the action we will have Hikaru Nakamura in the semi-finals where he will face the winner 
of Magnus Carlsen versus Wesley. So Magnus Carlsen currently up in that match. And Ding Liren versus Yu Yang Yi goes into the third match to decide the other semi-finalist who will face the winner of Daniel Dubov against Sergei Kayakin. Yeah, I think it's been a, um, a very fair day, so to say. Um, talking about Hikaru going through against Lev, definitely he showed very much who's in control and who's boss today. Very deserving semi-finalist, Hikaru Nakamura. Ding Liren, Yu Yangi, again, a very, very deser deserving comeback to, uh, to Ding after the way it went in the first mini match and the way he was in control today. So it just, uh, it just felt like um, things balanced out there. And um, no, I think it just gives a feeling of a little bit of fairness in chess, how things have worked out. We've had plenty of drama. We will see you guys soon. Join hashtag Heritage Chess on Twitter. Tell us your stories about the heritage of your chess origins. Pity about Levon Aronian, <clears throat> who leaves the tournament today. Everybody else, we will see back in action, including Tanya and Peter. In the meantime, you guys can also check out chessable.com slash Magnus, where the world champion shares the secrets. Thanks for watching. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone.